We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. not understand that they are that way because you're Joe Flacco. And you just like to discredit things that people deserve credit for. That you can't possibly be expected to defend that. Talk about the game, Sam. So Who cares about what people think about us. Yeah, I like the ball, I like football season, all the things that go with it. Welcome in to the PFF NFL Podcast. Steve Palazzolo back here with Sam Monson. We're on to week nine. You ready, man? Yeah. This will be past the halfway point because there is no even halfway point. 17 weeks and all that jazz. It just flies by. We're waiting all season, all off season for the year. And here we are halfway through. Just before we get started, quick shout out to our friends over at Monkey Knife Fight. All first time depositors at Monkey Knife Fight that put at least $20 into their account. Well, using the promo code PFF, you guys have been hearing me talk about this. If you haven't done it already, just do it because you get the 20 bucks and you get a free PFF Edge annual subscription. $40 of value for just that 20 that you invest. You get the opportunity to turn 20 into even more money playing daily fantasy and prop games into one of the fastest growing fantasy sports sites in the country. It's Monkey Knife Fight. So go to Monkey Knife Fight, deposit your 20 bucks, use the promo code PFF and receive your free PFF Edge annual subscription of course 365 days of value there so no brainer do it right now monkey knife fight promo code pff let's get into all the action sam thursday night football the covid game 49ers at the green bay packers yes this game brought to you by covid uh everybody's out nobody's left uh the 49ers (laughs) have nobody left rogers mullen won yeah yeah so jimmy g out george kittle out all of their receivers out um, half the offensive line is banged up, retired, or out. Uh, Trent Williams gone. Nobody is left for the 49ers. The, and the Packers have no running backs. But running backs don't matter, so that's a bonus compared with what the 49ers are dealing with. So Packers by 100. I mean, the line is 7.5 and, and moving in that direction. Like, it's getting bigger, not smaller. So, yeah, I mean, look, Rodgers to the receivers is the key for this Green Bay Packers team anyway and now you've removed any reason they have to run the ball, so you've got to like the Packers. It feels like a long time ago, but last year, the Packers and Niners, they did play at San Francisco twice. NFC Championship game rematch. NFC Championship. Only nobody that played in that game is playing in this game for the 49 Completely different. But the first time they played, the Packers only scored eight points, and it was a disaster offensively. It was the worst offensive performance of the Packers' season, just the PFF team grade. 53.8, not good. Mm. But their second worst performance was in the NFC Championship as well. They ended up getting to 20 points, but it was a blowout. They had some late touchdowns there. Yeah, so that is the interesting part of this game, though, is we just saw what happened to Green Bay against Minnesota, right? And they're very different, but the way the Vikings beat the Packers is kind of what the 49ers are going to want to do to them and what they did to them in the NFC Championship game, right? Which is heavy formations running the ball all day and just destroying their defensive front up the middle um, or just against the run generally. The, the Vikings, what, the Packers are fascinating, right? You this idea of uh, nickel as the new base, right? Nobody yep. really plays base anymore. It's all nickel. It's all dime. The Packers are one of these teams that run dime as right. their base, right? So six defensive backs, which means if you roll out there with heavy offensive formations and force them into base, they that's the personnel package they use the least right right so there's no way they're as good at that as they are playing dime or nickel and if you're good enough and you can force them into that it just it it maximizes your chance of somebody blowing a gap right of somebody not being in the right place because they're those guys aren't used to playing particularly when their injury crisis has been at linebacker 
So they're already down to like nobody's at linebacker. And now you're forcing those guys to be on the field when they're not playing anyway. It's a way that you can rack up points, I think, and at least really cause this Green Bay defense problems. And all, even though the 49ers are like down to ribbons on the offensive side of the ball, it's, I mean, it still should be effective. It's going to be, it's going to take some real tin cupping from, uh, Rembrandt? Shanahan. Yeah. Real Rembrandting. I mean, if he comes out of this with a masterpiece in offense, we need to like, make make that guy a statue or something what you bring up though is fascinating because it happened at the college level teams played so much spread for years when you played a team that was like a traditional i formation downhill running team college players didn't they're like we don't know how to fit against the run against power like college guys don't know how to play like fundamental basic football and i'm saying basic as in like what the game was 10 to 15 years ago right so we'll see if the niners can get creative and force the packers into some uh some mismatches here. I still like the uh, I like the pack. I'm going with the going with the quarterback situation here. What what do we get from Mullins? He's been good other than that one disaster against the Eagles. Half of you have already watched this. So you're like, what are you talking about? But right, There's we're a previewing lot of time it because a game that Thursday. already happened. Yeah. Um, look, Mullins is usually enough quarterback for the quarterback proof offense. I, I mean, that's probably the best way of summing it up, right? He's usually not the reason you're going to lose the game. He was against the, the Eagles. But I think most of the time, he's not going to be the problem for this 49ers offense. All right. You got a, did you, do you think the Packers won the game you already won? I do think the Packers won the game that already happened that you saw that happened. Same. All right, let's get into the biggest games of the week, starting with Sunday night football. New Orleans Saints at the Tampa Bay Bucks. It's a rematch from week one. It's a battle for the for first place in the nfc south for positioning in the entire nfc it's the biggest game of the entire weekend drew Brees versus tom brady a lot to unpack here uh Brees and brady by the way back and forth mm. for this touchdown record we got to stop the game every time they break each other's record right <laughs> no. Brees had a big ceremony last year brady broke his record and then Brees broke it back and now brady has it again so he's got a one touchdown lead but the saints haven't had a bye yet you know so is Brees really in the lead for all-time passing touchdowns what a battle yeah uh in addition to that this is also interesting for how the perception of these two teams has changed since week one huge um week one the saints were heavy favorites won the game looked generally better now um the bucks are four and a half point favorites like people are talking about them as one of the best teams in the nfl i know they wobbled against uh the uh the giants right their their last yeah. opponent but they got the win, right? I, I, to an extent, I don't care if you got out, you escaped, you know, you got away with the the victory. I, I think they're still good enough. This though, we get Antonio Brown back, we get Michael Thomas back. Is that right? Yes, and Chris Godwin back for the Bucks. Right. So this is, I don't know how healthy all those guys are going to be, which is always the key for the for the Bucks this season. Yeah. That even when they've had their best players, they haven't necessarily been a hundred percent. But this is going to be interesting to watch the impact that all these weapons have because on paper, those three alone are like three of the best, what, six receivers in the NFL? Yeah, when, I mean, we don't know what we're going to get from Antonio Brown. He's played one game in the last two years. Right. but Did get a touchdown in that game and looked pretty useful, even though it was like three minutes into the building. Brady fed him like 10 targets in that game. Right. It was week two against Miami last year. So, um, well, let's start on the with the Bucks offense, right? So where does Antonio Brown fit in this offense we discussed it a little bit before but they like to run four wides a lot they like to mix up personnel packages I, I don't know if he's going to play more than 15 or 20 plays but I think he's going to have a role on this team despite already having Mike Evans Chris Godwin Scotty Miller they're getting Jaden Mickens making play I and mean, they had a lot of guys making plays Gronk's out there but I think Antonio Brown has a role yeah. on this offense so I think that's your answer right Jaden Mickens had 44 snaps against the Giants and I think led the team in targets that game for whatever bizarre reason. He was Brady's slot guy. He should have game. zero yeah. this game, right? right? Because between Godwin and uh, Antonio Brown being in there, all of those snaps should be used on those two guys. And if they're not, there's something significantly wrong at that point. So yeah, I mean, Jaden Mickens had seven targets, five catches against the Giants, 44 snaps. I would say the majority of those should go towards Antonio Brown and particularly this feels like, you know, week one, Antonio Brown, a lot of question marks. Is this a good idea? If you're Tom Brady, would you be leaning in his direction a little bit week one and then dial it back? That's what I wonder. Role? I wonder if that's what Brady did last year yeah. in their one game. It's like, exactly. make this guy happy, get him involved. Yeah. 
Um, to me, all, again, if you listen to us long enough, you'll hear me say over and over and over again, instill fear into the defense and get as many wide receivers as possible. I mean, that's what Tampa Bay is trotting out here. Their receiving leader right now in yards is Scotty Miller. Yeah. Right? They have Mike Evans. They have Godwin. Yes, they've been, both of the guys have been banged up, and Godwin's actually missed games. But Scotty Miller's their legitimate deep threat. So now you have – you ha- let Scotty be the stretch the field guy. Mike Evans has been more – you know, he's got seven touchdowns on his 30 catches. He's been a very specific red zone weapon. Gronk has been a red zone weapon. I think this offense looks different when Chris Godwin's out there. He's caught 86% of his targets from Brady this year. So they have a good connection when Godwin's healthy. I think it becomes a high-volume Godwin – Antonio Brown offense where okay then when you get into the red zone how do you stop this thing how do you stop it um and plus AB is really good with back shoulder stuff and you know Brady likes that that route tree and everything so I think they're going to figure it out and I think week one here for Antonio Brown it might only be like I said 10 15 20 snaps but I think if he's out there for 20 snaps he might see five or six targets right away um so what about the matchup on the other side. So the Saints defense is underachieved a little bit. They're going up against this good Bucks offense. But I think the other side of the ball, where the Bucks defense is being viewed as the best in the NFL, as far as, you know, not by our grades at the moment, but as far as what they're capable of, what we saw they were able to do from like a shutdown perspective against the Green Bay Packers a few weeks back. Can this Tampa Bay defense shut down a Saints offense that does struggle to throw the ball down the field. Well, this is where we find out how important Michael Thomas is, right? Because they're they're probably going to blitz Drew Brees a lot. They play man coverage a lot, which means you're dealing with tight windows. You have to be accurate and you have to throw with anticipation. And it's not that you can't b- defeat those defenses, but it means you have to be on your game. And it's going to be interesting to see, one, is accurate Drew Brees showing up? Can he put the ball pinpoint where it needs to go to beat that tight man coverage? And two... How much of a difference does Michael Thomas being there make to that, right? How much is he confident in where Michael Thomas is going to be that he can just drop back and hit him like 15 times in a game despite the man coverage because you know exactly where he's going to be. You're confident in the target that you're throwing to because like the problem with that Drew Brees arm strength stuff is it's just it puts the ball in the air for longer than other quarterbacks. And the longer it's in the air, the longer a defensive bank has to make a play on it. And that's the concern. So the way the Bucks are playing defense too, Jamel Dean, Carlton Davis on the outside, there was a couple passes Daniel Jones made that they were ready to pounce on. And, you know, Carlton Davis had the pick six against – it was Davis, right? He had the pick six against um, against Rodgers a few weeks back. Uh, did he – with the first one? Or was it Dean? Dean had the first one, and then Carlton Davis made the play on the slant for, okay. for a safety. To I'm sorry. Pick so off. Dean had. It. I'm just saying. The, so there, there are these two huge corners, former Auburn players, and they're look. They're, not only are they really good at press, but they are jumping underneath routes right now. And every week we come on here and say, look, if you're if you're playing the Saints, do you just dare Breeze to throw the ball over the top? You just dare him. I think the way the Bucks have been squatting on underneath underneath routes. They're gonna they're gonna dare Breeze to throw the ball over the top, and I'm not saying he can't do it, but it's a second game outdoors now. It's at night, so they're still gonna have that vitamin D deficiency. But it's mm. it's at night. But Breeze did not throw the ball well in windy conditions last week against the Bears, underneath stuff only. It should be it's, it might with a little wind, a little rain potentially on Sunday night in Tampa Bay. It could be a factor if the Bucks are really aggressive and saying, "Go ahead." throw the ball 20 25 yards down the field we dare you i think i mean i think the bottom line is from either one of our descriptions they are going to make drew Brees play within an incredibly narrow margin of error right and if they're going to win this game and if the offense is going to be good he's going to need to hit that right it's an it's an insanely small target to be hitting we know he's capable of doing it but it's it's hard right that's the bottom line is they're going to make life tough on Brees to execute this game plan and he needs to show that he can still do it uh, and this is the game we've been talking about, right? Like, yeah. this is the game you are judging the Saints on. Can you beat what is perceived as one of the best teams in the NFL? Because this is your Super Bowl path. If you think that Drew Brees is coming away with a second Super Bowl ring and another championship, this is the test. Um, even even if they do have to throw the ball underneath, it's going to come down to tackling Alvin Kamara in space, Michael Thomas, the underneath stuff that has been really efficient for the Saints. I mean, the, the passing offense is still efficient. For the Saints, and despite Breeze in seven, you know, playing three good games out of seven, essentially to this point, so they're winning despite him um, for the most part with that 
little three game sample in the middle where he played well. So um, I think we're going to have a lot of answers coming out of this one. Who do you like in Bucks Saints Sunday Night Football here? Uh, I do like the Bucks. I think until given a significant reason not to that they are the best team in the NFC. So let's ride that. Yeah, I think it's honestly, I think it's a statement game for the Bucks. I think they're they came out of a sleepwalking against the Giants on yeah. Monday Night Football. Um, I'm not saying it's going to be just like the Packers game a few weeks ago when they really made a statement, but I think I think teams are going to be I think the NFL is going to be saying, you know what, the Bucks could be up there with the Chiefs as best team and the Steelers coming out of this game. So I get the Bucks winning and uh, making a statement against the Saints in the division battle. All right. Let's go to Buffalo. What's happening back there, guys? We just died in the... Uh... It's supposed to be soundproof. What's happening back there, producers? Seattle Seahawks at the Buffalo Bills. Look at this one. This is a good one. Bills getting three points at home against the Seattle Seahawks. Here's my big question. Mm -hmm. Seattle has our number one run defense grade. Not a huge deal, but they're, you know, they got this old, they can stop the run pretty well. Can't rush the pass, but they can stop the run. Buffalo's dead last. Run stop grade. Is this the game? Every week I'm going to ask, is this the game they pull Russ out of the kitchen? <laughs> is this the game? Are they so tempted by Buffalo's leaky run defense that Seattle tries to run the ball? And I'm not saying that's a bad strategy necessarily. I'm not saying like it's not the week to go at you know, average six a pop, even though you've got running back injuries. But I'm always curious at the second second half of the season here if they take a little bit off Russ's plate. Well, that's where it becomes interesting, right? Is that there are going to be games where it might actually make some sense, and this might be one of them. Like, as much as you're being celebrated and lauded for this let Russ cook strategy, and it's turned you into one of the most formidable offenses in the NFL, what happens when you run, against, run up against a team who are just going to give you six yards of carry on the ground? Like, I mean, the Chiefs were happy to take that, right? Yeah. The Chiefs were didn't have a problem with taking the ball out of Mahomes' hand, albeit in crappy conditions. So it made a little bit more sense. But they were perfectly happy to say, all right, we'll take that all day long. That's that's cool. But if you're Seattle and suddenly everything has been going so well with this let Russ cook strategy, are you okay with reverting back to conservative ground and pound? Let's establish the run and that's how we win. I'm okay with it because I think part of balance on offense that I keep saying is run the ball when the, when given the opportunity, run the ball well is fine. Um, I'm not saying you got to you know start the game with 15 runs and you know a couple play actions and that's it, but you adjust to what the defense gives you. So if it is Buffalo playing a little bit conservative, playing their too high shell, saying we're not going to let Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf beat us, which again that's what they did against Kansas City very much, right? They invited the run and said let's just not lose to Tyree Kill and Travis Kelsey, and ultimately what they give up like 26 points or whatever. It's kind of a win if you're Buffalo if you can hold Seattle in the mid 20s then it's all right this is josh allen has to come back right josh allen has to be first four weeks josh allen spread the ball around against a poor pass defense of seattle and that's your best bet in winning so if seattle is given the opportunity to run the ball fine run the ball a little bit more but you still have to let russ create some big plays as well yeah the other thing i'm endlessly fascinated by is somehow dk metcalf keeps running up against this like sequence of tiny cornerbacks now um, Tredavious White is less tiny than the other cornerbacks he's faced, but still, we're talking 5'11", 190 pounds, going up against, what, 6'4", 230. That's still a monster mismatch in terms of size. Um, and Buffalo does shadow or use their cornerbacks to shadow. So, And the thing is, it would be Tredavious White, I think, that shadowed him on the basis that the other option is potentially Levi Wallace, who's even more lightweight. Yeah, but do... Do you play this the way, say, the Patriots like to shadow, which right. is Tredavious White should be getting the best route runner more so than just the best, the biggest threat, right? Tredavious White is probably a better fit against Tyler Lockett one on one, but potentially on an island. And then you throw six guys on DK, <laughs> you know, that's and that's the that's the strategy for taking those guys out. But interestingly, when you look at where they have used. Tredavious White to shadow receivers, it's been bigger receivers. Yeah. Bizarrely. It's been No, I'm just guys, wondering nobody's as big as DK too. So how does that does Yeah, that but it's been strategy? it's been that style. It's been the Preston Williams, the Brashad Perrimans, the um Zay Jones. Like it's been the bigger guy, not the quicker, smaller guy, right? Yeah. So um I, I just think that's an interesting matchup. DK Metcalf against anybody poses a problem, but particularly 
against the Buffalo corners that are lightweight, relatively small guys, and they have a tendency to track receivers. Does that just put Tredavious on an island against a guy that's, what, what five inches and 40 pounds heavier than him all game long? Which is, it's not that he can't cover him. It's just, man, that's a tough assignment. You know, I think, I think this is going to be a good game, man. I'll be watching that matchup. I, if it is Tredavious versus DK straight up, it's going to be awesome. It's a great matchup. I, we always joke about Seattle playing crazy games. I think it's another one. I think it's I, Josh Allen. I got the I got the numbers here. Where is he? Post post uh, apology, Sam. Seventy three grade. It's still middle of the pack. He's not playing horribly. Seventy three grade. His passer rating is seventy nine. Stats are bad. Mm -hmm. So Bills fans, believe it or not, Josh Allen is playing better than his stats hmm. the last four games. Okay. In our biased world, yes. we're actually grading him better than his actual stats. Um, but that was that's a lot closer to like the preseason predictions of he doesn't have to play great football. He should be able to produce with these playmakers. I think that gets back on track this week. I think the Buffalo passing game looks a lot better, and it comes down to Josh Allen versus Russell Wilson in the fourth quarter making plays. We also get the debut of Carlos Dunlap on this defense for Seattle that – should be their best pass rusher right out of the gate on the basis that their previous other best pass rushers are their linebacker and their safety. Good run defense gets even better. Yeah. Jamal Assuming Adams, it's last questionable, that. limited participant in Wednesday's practice. If he's back, that transforms that defense, makes it significantly better and different. Um, and if you suddenly have Carlos Dunlap, the newly found threat of Bobby Wagner on the blitz and Jamal Adams on the blitz, that's not easy to contend no, with. No, that's what I want to see. We've talked about that quite a bit here on the show. Jamal Adams blitzing over 10 times per game. Never been done in the Pete Carroll era. Blitzing a safety that often. Mm -hmm. And then Bobby Wagner blitzing 20 times last week. Getting a career high. Six pressures. That has never really been done in the Pete Carroll era either. Where you take a linebacker. He's usually two, three, five per game. He was legitimately A gap, B gap. In creating havoc last week. So I'll be looking forward to that entire matchup. I think Buffalo could look at Seattle's run defense too and say, you know what, this is a Josh Allen game from start to finish. Put the ball in his hands. Right. I also hope that the addition of Carlos Dunlap doesn't take away what they were doing on the blitz, right? Like if the idea that, okay, we have a guy that can actually win one-on-one -on -one every now and again, so we can, we're good now. Let's, let's get more conservative and dial it back. No, no, no. Like the, the stuff you were doing with the blitz was working. Now yeah. you were forced into it because nobody can win up front. But what if you add a guy that can win up front to that? That's way better to me in terms of net overall. One guy that can win up front, two guys that can be effective on the blitz from different areas, add all that together, and you're a way more difficult defense to contend with than you are if you just go, well, we're going to back off, play coverage, and let Carlos Dunlap lead the line. It was awesome. It was really fun to watch, actually, against San Francisco. It was like they were really trying to get the ball out of Jimmy G's hands as fast as possible yeah. with Wagner forcing the issue. I might do that against a Josh Allen in a similar way. Say, okay, you're going to get the ball out of your hands quickly. And if you don't, if you hesitate, if you misread one time, you're going to get popped or you're going to, you know, you're going to be in trouble, right? You got to if you make them rely on the quick game and getting the ball out of Allen's hands and make decision after decision after decision on the way down the field. So we'll be watching Seattle's blitz against Buffalo, their pass, you know, pass protection and Josh Allen's decision making. That's what I'll be keeping an eye out for so seattle by three right now on the road where are you leaning in this one uh, i will take seattle and the three i'll take seattle to win i think i really think this is a big game for for the bills i think they keep it close they're at home it, and it becomes a fourth quarter josh allen versus russell wilson game um i don't know if buffalo is going to win but i think if i had to if i had to wager i like buffalo keeping it close so I, i'm going to lean that uh taking the bills with the points okay. in one of the best games of the week here the other really awesome game this week baltimore ravens at the indianapolis colts another game brought to you by covid what do we have covid wise so here? marlon humphrey tested positive from the tests of the morning of the game so played last week right with covid uh clear i passed the test on saturday failed the test on sunday which they don't get the results of until after the game so he gets uh, shut down with on the COVID list and then a bunch of close contacts because game day traveling all that kind of stuff so Matthew Judon Patrick Queen Deshaun Elliott LJ Fort Malik Harrison 
Uh, Bonds, Tyus Bowser, all can't practice this week because they've been deemed close contacts. But they could play if they're cleared they're likely back. from the COVID test before the game. Right? So assuming none of them actually develop COVID, they will play in this game. They just want to practice all week. How do you think that affects things? I mean, it <laughs> can't be helpful, tested. right? Depth is really tested for uh, Baltimore's defense there. Yeah. I mean, it, it can't be useful to have half your defense not able to practice this week. Um, but playing, I think, is the bigger part of this. They, If they're all able to play, Marlon Humphrey is a big loss, not just because he's a really good player, but because they ask him to do the stuff in that secondary that they basically don't trust anybody else to be able to do. You know, when when designated guys go down, it's Marlon Humphrey that has to pick up the slack and play in the slot or take weird coverage assignments. If he's not there, I think that presents a bigger hole to the defense than just the absence of a really good player. Yeah, that yeah. If, if Humphrey's not there, that's that is massive because I think a big part of this game every single week for the Colts is what are you going to get from Phillip Rivers? Yeah. And are you going to get the ridiculous decision-making that shows up every now and again? Um, or are you going to get efficient Phillip Rivers, which has showed up a lot this season where it's like, you know what, I'll, I'll dink and dunk and I'll take a few shots and, you know, he's still fairly accurate. It's just when he starts to throw ducks into coverage yeah. where there are issues for the Colts. And I'll, I'll lean back on the indoor-outdoor thing. They're in, 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 in Indianapolis. He's been less likely to play like that at home. But Baltimore creates as much indecision in quarterbacks as any team. You don't know where the blitz is coming from. Uh, you don't know where, you know, their twists and stunts and all that stuff. Those, they are equipped to force Rivers into one or two of those decisions in this game. Yeah, Rivers, though, his mistakes this season have been more of the unforced error variety than they have of the confused, you know, indecision and coverage issue. It's like he's, whatever he is, what did we say, what, 38 years old now? Um, Our age. Yeah. Like at 38. With twice as many kids as me. He's not, yeah, that's an achievement. <laughs> he's, um, like he's not struggling to diagnose coverages, right? He's seen it all. He understands what he's looking at. You're not going to confuse Philip Rivers to the point where he sort of panics and heaves the ball to the wrong place. But you can basically leave him to confuse himself just in terms of like, where am I going? Where am I going? All right, late to the flat. Oops. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like he, I think when you, when you reach that age, you just, it's very hard to understand that you don't have the arm anymore, Steve. You know, you can't throw your fastball anymore. It's gone. It's not there anymore, and you're never going to get it back. Yeah, I'm aware. And it's hard, to, it's hard to accept that late in life. So I think Rivers has just reached that point where in his brain, he can still make those throws, and he doesn't realize until the ball's already in the air. You know, like the muscle memory is just a little bit faster than his brain at this point. Oh, so he puts the ball in the air and then only realizes when it's on its way to the cornerback <laughs> that that's a throw I can't make anymore. It is the saddest thing. I mean, because I don't play baseball anymore, so I can't relate to that part. But, you know, when we played pickup hoops, yeah. and my brain was saying, make this quick move and yeah. dro- drop your jump hook in there, and then uh-huh. you're like, man, I'm moving in slow motion Yeah, here. it's not there anymore. It sucks. But so the unforced errors you're talking about from Rivers, though, it's phantom pressure. You know, that was the issue in the Browns game a few weeks back. He felt pressure that wasn't necessarily there. Nobody's going to create that other than the Steelers, maybe as much as the Ravens create that phantom pressure so rivers has to be good over and over and over again we talked about josh allen make decision after decision after decision i think that's what comes down to rivers and i'm going to use the same i'm going to use the same analysis on what the colts are going to do to lamar you know the colts are they play very little man coverage it's going to be it's a lot of zone it's a lot of uh make you make a lot of decisions you know 10 play drives was what they're trying to make you know offenses uh, have to to move the ball on them right not not you know keep the ball in front not allow a lot of big plays in Lamar Jackson's decision making has been poor in recent weeks his you know, blind spot for linebackers mm-hmm. the last couple of weeks um it's one of those things that showed up in college quite a bit if he was going to have a turnover worthy play a lot of times it was like yeah there's a middle linebacker there whoops um, that's what we saw last week against the Steelers a couple times so Lamar has to make decision after decision against a very safe Colts defense that's playing really well right now. He does. And the whole Ravens offense is kind of in um, – it's in it, it's in a key part of the season for them. You know, people are asking what's wrong with the Ravens offense, and they've still been doing pretty well. Like, it's not like the run game has disappeared. And 
everything is a disaster, but it is it noticeably right. But it is noticeably less effective than it was a season ago. Um, and Lamar Jackson is noticeably less effective than he was a season ago. And I think all of the things that are wrong are affecting each other. It's not, it, they're all sort of force multipliers, right? The lack of a Marshall Yanda and the fact that the, his replacement is nowhere near a Hall of Fame caliber level, the injury that Lamar has been dealing with, the fact that the windows are tighter, all of these things rolled up together are sort of making every other aspect of it slightly worse. And I think teams are starting to revert back to the old Miami Dolphins game plan heading into last year, which didn't work, right? Oh, well, we don't trust you. We don't think you're a good enough passer, so we're just going to load up against this run offense and dare you to pass over the top. And he was like, <laughs> okay, five touchdowns later, whoa, oh, that, we can't do that this year. That's a bad plan. This year, though, I think teams are starting to edge back towards that style of game plan because all the reasons that meant he could just air it out five touchdowns later are not – quite where they were a season ago i'll be keeping an eye on darius leonard middle of that colts defense what a monster game he had last week we mentioned it on the review show playing the run blitzing strip sack making plays in coverage linebackers against this ravens offense always have such a challenge right you have to you have to be a good you have to be able to shed blocks at the second level in the run game you have to be able to take on linemen or beat linemen to the spot in the run game and then the play action game puts you on a string uh, maybe more than any other play action game just because of Lamar as a rushing threat. So Darius Leonard, a huge factor in this game, number four graded linebacker, number three, if you set the filters properly, which we will hmm. for Darius. He's the third best linebacker in the league this year. Okay. Friend of the show, Darius. And uh, on pace to be a part of the one-on-one, we'll get him back on the show when yeah. he is. What's interesting is Lamar Jackson's PFF grade on essentially tight window throws is the same this year from where it was a year ago. The difference is the wide the hell open windows are not as frequent and as open as they were last season. Good analysis, Sam. So this is what I was saying, right? The All the things affecting everything else, like we talked all, all the time about how Lamar's threat as a runner and his ability in the run game and how dominant that run game was is what made his own life easier as a passer because it opened up all the space for these throws. It isn't this year. And whether that's because teams are shutting down the run easier or whether they're because they're crowding all those spaces teams have started to figure out this offense in a way they couldn't a season ago now you can definitely say in addition to that the personnel isn't where it was a season ago and that's helping them figure it out but there's a genuine sense that this offense is not quite as unstoppable as it was last season I also want to look at his, on those open throws, what's he throwing from an uncatchable standpoint this year versus last year? If I can find his name right now. Yeah, I don't know that. It's not that big of a difference. Okay. If anything, right? So, so the difference in his accuracy, we thought he might regress a little bit accuracy-wise. When I think your analysis is correct, he's played throw for throw. There are some similarities to last year, He's had, but he's got fewer opportunities. Right. So, yes, that would be a sign of adjustment from the NFL to Lamar so far this season. Yeah, but it, the the question is whether the adjustment is teams essentially identifying the code to crack this offense or whether it's just that the code is easier now because the personnel isn't as good. They don't have tight ends. Right. They don't have the same type They're of... They're on the uh, same tight ends. They don't have the weapons. interior offensive line. The run right. game isn't as potent because of that. Lamar hasn't been as potent on the ground because of the injury and all those other things. Like, that, that's the question, essentially, is did teams crack the code or did the code get easier? It's like... Uh, Remember Beverly Hills Cop, Steve? Yeah. Beverly Hills Cop 2? Whichever one it is, where they have the code, the, uh, the alphabet bandit. The alphabet bandit, and eventually Eddie Murphy in the car cracks the code because he made it really easy. Not because Eddie Murphy cra beat the computer guys, but because the code was really easy. Eddie Murphy, NFL defensive coordinator. There you go. Who do you like in this Ravens-Colts matchup? Uh, I still think I like the Ravens. Yeah, I'm going to lean Ravens here, too. Even if they don't have any players, because even goes. if they don't, I think they'll all play. They'll come back and play. So everybody's they're making it a point to get back on the field on Sunday, despite what happens in the in the in the week for the most part. Guys are making it there. You know, Thursday games are tough as Packers and Niners are, but yeah, I'll take Baltimore in this one, favored by two and a half at Indy this weekend. So those games are huge. I think another another pretty good game: Chicago Bears at the Tennessee Titans. Mm -hmm. Teams trying to get back on track. Uh, the Bears falling back down to earth a little bit. Has Tennessee fallen back down to earth a little bit? 
a Ryan Tannehill led team that you know and Tannehill's not playing nearly as well the last couple of weeks but I think a lot of Tennessee's issues are on the defensive side of the ball so in this past week they released Vic Beasley and they bring in Desmond King for a sixth rounder let's discuss what does Desmond King bring to this Tennessee defense first he can't play though right they don't they don't get him in the building yet I don't think he's up COVID. there yet but just the, discussing the trade in general for the Titans oh, I mean I think the trade is a steal for them like Desmond King clearly he's worth more than a six round pick or whatever it was right there are clearly some issues between Desmond King and that Chargers defensive staff like they've I think essentially suspended him more than once like sat him down yeah for whatever is going on there so strictly on the field you can make an argument that Desmond King is as good a slot defender as there is in the NFL. Now, he's not scheme, he's not necessarily scheme proof. Like if you run pure man cover, if you're at the Detroit Lions, you probably don't want Desmond King as your slot corner. But for a team that runs a lot of zone, which is most teams in the NFL, I think Desmond King is about as good as it gets, even recognizing that he hasn't been as good recently as he had been earlier in his career. But he does everything well, right? He's effective on the blitz. He's really good against the run. He understands extremely well uh, route concepts and how to be in the right place at the right time in coverage, keeping things in front of him. Plus, Always had that skill, yeah. Right. Plus, and you've seen, you know, there have been videos where he sort of articulated what he's looking at in terms of route concepts to understand that. It's tape study. It's smart stuff. It's good study habits. Um, plus, the Titans' slot coverage situation has been a wreck this season. Like, they're, the guy they have manning the slot right now is a great in the 30s. So almost regardless of what Desmond King is bringing to the table, it's an upgrade. The comp I had for Desmond King coming out was Logan Ryan. And I think he's he's exceeded Logan Ryan expectations to this point in his career. But the point was sure, tacula, sure tackler and, and just a good solid football player. Now King has been better than that. My question though, he has only, he's played that cover three charger scheme. Very simple, quote unquote, simple role. He's playing the slot. He's playing the curl flat in that slot. Um, every now and again, you, know, you get a match up with vertical routes and you just keep the ball in front of you uh, defensively. He does do that extremely well. So we'll see how the Titans end up using him. He is out this week uh, due to the trade. What's happening here? Uh, you just guys are talking. What are, you what are you looking for in this one? Bears and Titans both trying to get back on track here. I want to see if this Ryan Tannehill regression has hit. If it's finally happened that Tannehill has taken this step backwards and is not the best, one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL anymore. Um, you know, we've been talking up that as a prospect, expected it to happen coming into this season. It didn't. He kind of maintained that form, but the last couple of weeks has fallen off. Um, yeah. So or did just he just have a for couple bad games? He's the eighth graded quarterback in the NFL right now mm -hmm. versus, you know, being top three last year throughout yeah. much of his run. Two weeks ago against Pittsburgh, 47 grade. It was against Pittsburgh. Yes. Um, the stats didn't show it, but he had a, a few passes that should have been picked. And then last week, a 69.5 grade against the Bengals, who have been, you know, friendly to quarterbacks in general. So I think that's part of the concern there. It was only a 69.5. Um, so yeah, is he an 82 PFF type of quarterback? I think that's, if we had to predict where he was going to be this season from a grading standpoint, I would have said probably like 78 to 82. I said that's where he yeah. would have been. Even if he took a, a step forward in general from where he was with the Dolphins, he's still a low 80s type of guy which puts him in that top 10 range but not at that range where he was so efficient last year the titans offense was unstoppable yeah i mean i think right now he's settled into the area we expected him to be it's just that it came in by way of like maintaining that level for a while and then falling off precipitously uh then the uh the nick Foles experience on the other side wow the with nick the bears Foles experience same thing i mean he had some big throws last week had some picks he had some you know, holding the ball too long at times. A Tennessee pass rush that's been, you know, non-existent this year. A Desmond King free secondary that has struggled. Is this the game where Foles gets on track God. with the Bears? I'm tired of the Nick Foles experience. Are you? Yes. I, I just love I, We need more Nick Foles data points. Do we, though? Yes. Because at this point, we've talked all the time more about how he is the single points. most volatile quarterback in the NFL week to week. This more year, data points. This year, his <laughs> grades, 62.9, 65.7, 66.8, 61.1, 51.8, and then 70.3. He's like, basically been in the same freaking area every damn week, 
and it's a crappy area to be in. List Radio with Mike Renner. Look, I only got, what, seven games in. I Let's didn't... go through his career grades now, 65, 65, 76, 73. I'm just saying, the single most volatile quarterback in the NFL has been incredibly consistently crappy this but season. But like, that was Jameis, right? Jameis would have the same grade at the end of the year, but, but the, the year. ride to get there was fun. But Jameis week to week was all over the place. This is the same every week. But within the game, it's all over the place with Foles. You don't I, know I just, what's going to happen. I grow tired of it. Yeah. And I'm not even a Bears fan. I can't even imagine if you're a Chicago fan how much you would want to be ending your you know, miserable game watching. I want to see how the Bears handle the explosive playmakers of the Titans, A.J. Brown and Corey Davis. Because... Corey Davis. Uh, the Bears do a pretty good job of making you earn it, you know, making you work for those for those big plays. And I think that's been that's been a huge part of the Titans game is chunk plays with AJ Brown. Um, we'll see how the Bears do with you know Derrick Henry in the run game because they've got a you know pretty good front. And you know, I think the Bears their Bears are a tough team, but just so unexciting in an NFC that you know is better than where they are right now. You you have the Bears as a Super Bowl contender though, so what? You loved them. You loved the Bears after a I few said weeks. that. I mean, I said they are still a dangerous playoff-bound team because they're able to win despite having relatively crappy quarterback play. And if the quarterback ever does show up and play better, then they become really hard to beat. Like here's, if that happens at the right time. Here's the key. Bears' offensive line has been beat up. And now COVIDed. And COVIDed with uh, Cody Whitehair in the mix here. And uh, Spriggs, right? The Titans have to get. Spriggs was rough last week as well rough and then COVID. Right. The tight, this would be the game where the Titans pass rush gets in order. No, Titans fans are wondering why dude, Jadavian Clowney has no sacks. They just played the Bengals. I know. This I'm, What I meant to say, it's the second straight week where they have an opportunity to get in order. <laughs> Last week, they actually, they had, it was one of those, they had hurries. They didn't have, they, they didn't had have two many of them, hits. Though. They had hurries. They had a decent number of hurries. They had 10 of them and it took them, six, the, those two guys, Clowney and Harold Landry had 10 hurries and it took them 66 pass rushes to get them yeah borrow getting rid of the ball you'll get home with Foles. the titans are going to get home with Foles holding the ball too long in this one i like tennessee i like tennessee to get back on track and uh actually show some life defensively here they're they're favored by six at home with the bears what do you think i don't like that i, I don't like the six either think i think they'll it's closer, win but, but i would like the bears to cover take bears with yeah. the points if it stays at six all right, I'm with you there. Tennessee wins. Let's go AFC West. Las Vegas Raiders, Los Angeles Chargers, Carr versus Herbert. I did a little uh, Herbert versus Burrow breakdown. Took our discussion from the podcast and tried to tried to put some words to it this week in my QB review. How'd it go? I thought it was awesome. Oh, okay. It really is fascinating when you look at Justin Herbert's. You know, my favorite thing: big time throws, turnover worthy throws. Right? Mm -hmm. Herbert's in the top ten in both. <laughs> right the extreme end so we, we've talked about his turnover worthy plays here it's not that they're coming in abundance they're just they their timing's bad they actually turn into interceptions for the most part the extremes for herbert are better than burrow but then herbert's in the 20s at avoiding all overall negatives and then overall positives so almost like all of herbert's best throws are are just positively graded throws are big time throws right and he's avoiding the disastrous ones. Burrow's the complete opposite. He's in the 20s yeah. at the extremes, big time throws, turnover worthy, but he's got a high percentage of positives and he's avoiding negatives. So, really, the throw for throw consistency for Burrow is winning. So, this is it's the discussion between those two guys is a little bit like the discussion we used to have with NFL people about offensive linemen, right? Yeah. Which is more useful, a guy that buries his man every now and again, but will also lose a lot and in the middle in between isn't great. Or the guy that just never, ever loses, but also never gets that crushing block, just consistently wins a little bit here and there, you know, just enough to get by. And for us, the guy that j does just enough will usually grade better. Um, but I think a lot of NFL people want to look at the highlight guy and be like, oh, that's the upside. We want that. We'll try yeah. and we'll try and smooth out the negative. But I want a guy that can do that so that I can hit that that great um, upside. And I think quarterbacks the same thing, right? I don't, but I don't think it's necessarily wrong to say, give me the guy that's making the spectacular plays, good and bad, um, because that's the the more valuable player is the one that can do that. It's the sort of Jameis Winston, Cam Newton argument, right? Eventually it'll all come together and we'll get MVP season. But 
the data would say that the other guy is the one that's more stable and predictable going forward. You have a greater degree of confidence that the consistently good guy, even without the highs and the lows, is going to be at that level going forward, whereas the other guy could be anywhere. The If you asked me what would you rather have, though, if you could guarantee what Justin Herbert's doing, top four in big-time throw percentage. No, and- that's the key. You can't guarantee that. If you, but I'm saying, what if you're telling me what's more valuable right now? I'd say it's the way Herbert's playing, because I know if I'm going to get four big time throws from him a game. Have you checked it, where they are in WAR, by the way? Because they end up in about the same place. No, because it's. I, I don't think they get into. It's not at the play level, so WAR would probably be similar for both guys. Bur- Burrow's WAR would be higher because of the volume. Okay, is what because it'd be snap count driven, uh, or because volume matters in that. Um, but. The actual value of plus one throws in our world, field flipping throws, they will lead to points. God, so if you could guarantee, it just occurred to me, you could have named them that instead. We, uh, field flippers, yeah, field flippers, field flipping plays, FFPs, drives that have at least one big time throw score like 65, 70 yeah. percent of the time. So you're guaranteed points with Herbert style, but you're just not guaranteed that he's going to be able to keep this up. Is the thing right? Right. So and um, we've already seen. Little hint of regression. Used to be the number one quarterback on third downs is like four now. Has already Are taken a step back. For it? I'm just saying it's just coming. Chargers like, fans. So all right, somebody, just be encouraged. The guy's some, having an awesome rookie season. Somebody on Twitter posed the question. I think it was Twitter. I can't remember who it was. Apologies. Basically said, all right. The one thing we left out of our previous Burrow Herbert discussion is the concept of what if Burrow is just good at those situations, right? And actually. He's being put in more of them because the Chargers have that conservative streak offense. You know, low, they try and they're in that try and protect him with running on first down mode, right? The thing that naivety in terms of what we know doesn't actually protect him of anything that hangs him out to dry. But because of that, he's being put in a ton of those situations. And what if he's just good at that? Burrow? Yeah. No, Herbert. Oh, just Herbert's just good at what he does? What if he's just good at the difficult to achieve, low low, uh, percentage plays? What I mean, if he's you, just a clutch guy that on third down or against pressure, he's good at that. It's an unstable thing, and it'll fluctuate wildly, but there are players that are good under pressure. Yeah, I mean, there are outliers and all that stuff, but yeah, I mean, you just you lean on what you would think historically. Because again, we would sit there and we, would, we were having this discussion in 2017, right? Carson yes. Wentz is in year two and doing incredible things. Big time throws left and right. He's, he's making plays. Thrown, t- he had a really high touchdown rate. Everything was good. Like, like, but I think what, like I said earlier, part of Herbert's success is inflated because his big time throws are also leading to seventy yard gains a few times instead of just thirty yard gains, right? And I'm, I know I'm oversimplifying it a little bit, but when you drop the ball in a bucket, the throw isn't that isn't different whether you do it on your own thirty or the other thirty. But for one of them, you get seventy yards; the other one, you get thirty. So I think it's it's just a little bit inflated overall, though. You got to be encouraged by what Justin Herbert is doing. And he's going up against the lowest coverage grade in the league in the Las Vegas Raiders. So That should help. I like the Chargers here, man. I think they're going to pull it off and not blow this one. (laughs) Well, the key to them clearly is to keep the lead under 17 points because as soon as they stray above that 17-point threshold, that's when the collapse comes. That's when it all comes crashing down. Is this another game where the Raiders have to open it up a little bit more and try to compete because of what you're facing in Herbert and because of how your defense is playing. I think all their games are like that. Got to stay aggressive. Like all their games, they need to be aggressive because they don't have the defense to stop good offenses. Raiders fans aren't thrilled, I don't think, with our Derek Carr grades. He does have the biggest disconnect between passer rating, QBR, and his actual PFF grade, 68 passing grade from Carr. Some of that's rolled into fumbles in the pocket. He had a fumble on a scramble last week. He threw one directly to a uh, defensive lineman that was dropped. He's getting turnover luck and a little bit of general luck. A lot of the time you see people complain about that, and you're like, well, what about the plays that he didn't get credit for that bounced in his direction? Like his arguably his best play last week against the Browns was the touchdown that didn't count to Henry Ruggs. Yeah, that counted for us. Right. These are the things. We're giving him credit for those. The point is we're giving him – of appropriate credit on either in, in either direction for every single play he makes. And when you net all of those together, his grade is worse than the numbers. It's not that we're like ignoring those good plays and only pinging him for the negative ones that don't show up. Like we're giving him credit on either direction. It's just that when you do all that, 
and you do it every single play, it drags him downwards. The the Raiders are still in the playoff hunt here, and the, the, but they just have to improve on the back end. You know, they're disappointing play from Corey Littleton at linebacker. He's supposed to be one of the better coverage linebackers. We talk about the instability of that in general. He's got a 37 coverage grade right now, uh, and you just don't have corners that you can trust every week. We've seen flashes from Trayvon Mullen, but not enough throughout the year. So it's really tough to trust the Raiders on the back end right now is my thought. So I'm leaning Chargers despite all of their collapses. I'm buying into Herbert. The They're Chargers, favored by one. Yeah, which is interesting for a team that's, what, two and five, complete yeah. opposite direction of uh, the Raiders. Um, I, I, I think they are legitimately a team that is better than the record. Like, I know you can look at the idea they keep throwing away 17-plus point leads and say that's indicative of something fairly rotten at the core of this team. But, I mean, they're getting out to those big leads, and Herbert is not – disappearing as a guy who's making these big plays at which point like eventually that has to stop happening you can't keep blowing leads that big it's just too hard to do it is you can't do it every week chargers they're gonna win this game yeah man raiders fans are angry at us always detroit lions at the minnesota vikings stafford matthew stafford's on the covid list for the second time this year yes first one was a false positive this was uh, potentially just the just precaution it is just precaution this is being a close moment. contact with somebody outside the building that has it right um so we're thinking stafford's likely back yes for this game can be cleared same boat as the ravens defense <laughs> all of it yes so detroit at minnesota minnesota's favored by four better than you think sam those vikings i don't they're not i don't think they are I really don't. Well, you th their defense is still think garbage. That they're like the fifth worst team in the league or fourth worst team. They're not that they bad. They might be. They're not. Why not? Because much like the Falcons, if you just have just having Cousins, Thielen, and Justin Jefferson, and then a couple of games of Dalvin Cook going off, it gives you a baseline of like five or six wins. Right, which might make you one of the worst six teams in the NFL. There are some bad teams in the NFL. There are, and those teams like the Jets will be winning because you're automatically zero or one game. You have the Jets in the NFC East. Yes, right. That's ah, your baseline NFC of East, bad. That's true. The NFC East makes it tough. Jets, NFC East, and then it's a battle for all number right. six. But they might be in. They all right. Fair. There might be six. Jaguars. It's them or the Jags for six as the sixth worst team in the NFL. No. Houston. Watson's supposed to give you a higher baseline as well than what they have. Right. Dallas right now, they're in the, already, the NFC East. Yeah. They're already accounted for. Anyway. I don't look. The offense, I think, is fair to say the offense should be better than it's been for a lot of the season. But the defense is a mess. Like Mike Zimmer is saying. They played good football last week. Yes. They have a coaching baseline, too, where Zimmer has... That helps. But Games look, look at the problems good. on this defense, right? He's talking about, yeah, all these young cornerbacks, they're in kindergarten right now. And we need to get them on the master's track, right? Yeah. Kindergarten to master's degree in the space of one season is quite the leap. I don't know if you have a master's degree, Steve, but I do. And it took me, what, 20 years of schooling to get there. So it's not going to happen in the space of a season. Did you just degree shame me? I did, yeah. I'm like the best qualified worthless bum that you're going to find around here. Next thing you know, you're going to throw, you know, my, my dad's a doctor at, at us. No, not yet. We don't have an injury thing coming up yet. I as a hit that later. As a doctor's son, let me evaluate this ankle injury. Look, I, I'm 2-0 and oh over the last two weeks in evaluating crazy injuries. Growing up nothing. around doctors my whole life, let me tell you. That's what I'm saying. There's a whole market for that. Right I'm just now, saying, so you could be that guy. like kindergarten to master's degree doesn't happen in a season, right? These young cornerbacks might end up good, but it's not going to happen this year. They're going to be a problem all season long which is exacerbated by the fact that the defensive line can't get any pressure or stop the run necessarily. Like their defense is essentially two all pro safeties and Eric Kendricks holding this thing together with scotch tape and bailing wire. Like, and, and Mike Zimmer occasionally dialing up a great play on third down. That's, Usually against Stafford. Right. And that's fine, but it's not going to hold out long term. They're going to be a problem all season long. They're so gonna, the offense needs to be cooking. Now they're, they're going to beat the Lions. Yeah? Who I'm out on after they disappointed me last week. Unless Chase Daniel starts? Unless Chase Daniel starts. Uh, Kenny, Gall Kenny Galladay's out, right, for the Lions. They've been a different offense without Kenny Galladay. They have. Stafford's been back. To you called him Jay Cutler the other day, which looking back I didn't back call was, him Jay Cutler. It's a little harsh. I asked if he was a coach killer like Jay Cutler. Would you stop besmirching you the comparison? You said he's worse than Jay Cutler. I didn't say he's worse than Jay Cutler. <laughs> Look. 
comparisons are made are there to be made between players. It doesn't mean you're equating them. I think there are similarities between Jay Cutler and Matthew Stafford. That doesn't mean they're the same human being or even at the same level. But Jay Cutler was a career coach killer. He spent his entire career ending the tenures of coaches that he played for because they, everybody was chasing the, the one great Jay Cutler year that never really came. I think the same thing is true with Stafford. Everybody is chasing the half season of 2019 that has never really become a full season of anything and certainly not multiple seasons of that level of play. Yeah, he's been he's been pretty volatile this year. He was coming off a 90 grade and he struggled last week with turnovers. He did have the big time throw of the week though. Huh. 59 yards from the line of scrimmage, 65 yards in the air. He just threw an absolute bomb into space, into wide open space for a 70 plus yard uh, gain. So Stafford can still uh, flip the field, Sam, mm. with the arm. FFBs. But man, Matt Patricia in year three here, the Lions with a 43.5 team coverage grade. Yeah. That's the story of the year. It's not good. They've Bob. they've thrown they've played more zone they've they've mixed it up they've tried to evolve defensively from what where they've been it's a massive issue I think they'll keep it close they they play those close games so I, I like Detroit as a four dog a four point underdog but I like Minnesota to win yeah All really right. you agree well I don't think the Lions are particularly good either I don't think the Vikings are necessarily better than people think they are but I don't I, I mean the Lions are not great either. Quick take on Pittsburgh Steelers at the Dallas Cowboys. Hmm. A 14-point spread for the Steelers. We're in Dallas. Look, at least we're not getting another game of Ben DiNucci. Poor Bless ben. him. It's not his fault. Like, the guy's a seventh-round pick out of, where is he from, James Madison? Yes. Like, that was never going to work. And they had, a, like, they, they had a game plan designed to prevent him from throwing the ball away, and he still had five turnover-worthy plays. He had no interceptions, Sam. Five turnover-worthy plays despite a game plan engineered around preventing him doing that. That is spectacular. Um, so we're getting Cooper Rush. We're getting a Cooper Rush slash Garrett Gilbert competition in practice this week, which will inevitably produce a Garrett Gilbert AAF MVP-led offense. <sighs> Cooper Rush, though, like preseason star. Yeah. For the Cowboys a couple years ago. So Either it's way. Cooper Rush's preseason performance against Garrett Gilbert's AAF performance. I'm, I'm going to say it's Cooper Rush. Look, nobody wins preseason MVP. You win AAF MVP. Mm. Or at least you would have done if they hadn't shut down the league. Um, so you're going with Gilbert as a starter. I'm yeah. taking Rush. And either one of them is going to get murdered against the best pass rushing team in the NFL. Who, by the way, are still on a pace to set a record for percentage of dropbacks pressuring the opposing quarterback. Now... Here's, I, I, well, let me give you a path to victory for the Cowboys. There is none. There is. No. Cooper Rush is a ginger. <laughs> there is okay. a plethora of ginger talent available available right now in the NFL. Carson Wentz is terrible. I, I think we. Andy need... Dalton is concussed and COVID. Yeah. Right? I think. Sam we... Darnold is terrible. Yes. I think we need to explore the possibility that Joe Burrow. Is actually ginger enough to qualify? And that would be the only thing. Siphoning he, off all the talent. He'd be. He's taking about ninety-eight percent of it right. right now. But if Joe Burrow is in fact not a, a ginger brunette, <laughs> then Cooper Rush. You have to go with the possible the upside of him, given the ginger talent available. It's a lot of talent available for those not um, for those that haven't listened to the podcast for three years. Really quick, we had a, a hilarious listener a couple of years ago come up and come up with the ginger theory mm. that there was only so much redheaded quarterback talents available and you could actually go back a few years and be like 2015 Carson Palmer was the only guy that was good that year and then Wentz in 2017 and like you know only one can be good at any only time one could be good at any sucking time. up all the ginger talent and the theory worked well until like this year when everybody was terrible so Cooper Rush has a chance yeah I think Pittsburgh can they cover 14 against Dallas here yes I think so as well Pittsburgh is going to end up 10-0 yeah. in a few weeks because of games like this on their schedule. Mm -hmm. um, I still want to see more from Big Ben. I think the one thing keeping people from really believing in the Steelers internally as well, um, we're, we're not of the belief that we put power rankings together by record. Hey, they're undefeated, therefore they're better than the Chiefs or the Bucs or right. Saints or whoever. Um, but if Big Ben played more consistent football, they're that more dangerous. I look at that maybe as a positive. Yeah. You know, that there's still more in there for Big Ben, but he has played just okay this season so far. 
Yeah, they're number four, I think, on our power ratings. If you go to PFF Greenline and look at the the data of how the sort of the data put together in our ELO rankings gives them points on a neutral field. Um, the Steelers are behind the Bucks, the Ravens, and the Chiefs. And again, people would say, well, they just beat the Ravens. They're there, therefore, they have to be better. And the right. Ravens have two losses, but it's just we're doing it differently, which is evaluating the and actual That wasn't team. even a neutral field. That was like the away field. It was. Anyway, uh, Pittsburgh's still a really good team. I think they crush Dallas here. Yeah. And potentially cover that 14. Giants at the Washington football team. WFT is favored by two and a half here. What are you looking for in this game? So our guy, uh, PFF Fantasy, Andrew Erickson, dropped this on Twitter. Daniel Jones is 3-0 and against the Washington football team and 1-17 and against not the Washington football team. I'm taking the Giants. Right? That's it. In his career. That's amazing. Yeah, that's, that's three of the four. Three of the guys' four wins have come against Washington, and only one win outside of that. I mean, if the Giants move on from Daniel Jones, you put that on the resume, and maybe the Eagles or Cowboys pick you up. Well, what if? Yeah, yeah. As a Washington killer, or Washington signs him on the basis that he always beats them. Oh, there you go. Protection. That's, yeah. Well, not like even defense. protection. You know that idea. I would like, start well, he, him. He went off against us, so we're going to bring him in. Yeah. Like we're the used to see. who was the the Green Bay edge rusher that the Colts signed because he had like. Six sacks against him. A couple oh, of, yeah. He's a pretty good run defender. Now you just... Oh, sorry. Um, but anyway, that theory, right? Daniel Jones. Eric just, uh, Walden. Liz, Eric yes. Walden. Um, he's quarterback Eric Walden. We bring him in. He just lit us on fire every time we play him. Uh, Daniel Jones <clears throat> against the Bucks the other night. He went full falls. I mean, it was fourth and 17. There's a lot of falls, actually. Too. There was a fourth and 17 prayer. Then there was... A sack he shouldn't have taken, I think, was in there. There was the ridiculous touchdown to Golden Tate. Great throw. There was a dropped interception that should have ended the game. And then there was late to flat to the flat on the two-point conversion that ends up getting broken up. Like, it was – that was a roller coaster ride of emotions. Very, very Folesian. So – It's also it, – it actually reminds me more of Wentz than it does of Foles. Uh, the way Wentz is playing this year, yeah. Well, I think their problems are the same, which is neither one of them – has worked out where the line is in terms of what you need to do, right? The football is often a lot about do your job, don't do somebody else's. Don't try and do somebody else's because that's where you get into trouble, right? Both Carson Wentz and Daniel Jones, and not unreasonably given what's around them, are of the opinion that like, I need to do it all, right? If, I'm, yeah. if I don't get this play done, nobody else is making a play and we're buried. So I need to try and make something out of nothing and that's when I end up heaving the ball 40 yards back across the field into double coverage to or be- running around the pocket knowing that there's a guy coming. Like, it's just they are trying to do too much right now. And as I say, it's, it's understandable because both of them are working behind bad offensive lines. Wentz hasn't had his receivers for most of the season. You can get why they're doing it, but most of the time you can't get away with that in the NFL level. Like, th- most people aren't Mahomes. That, but that's where volatility comes from, right? I mean, it's, I think you make an awesome point. And yes, they're somewhat justified given their supporting cast. But when we talk turnover-worthy plays, that's like a binary thing. Did you throw a pass that should have been picked or did you have a bad fumble? But when you do look at Daniel Jones, he had the two actual interceptions that he threw the other night. He's not misreading a dropping linebacker that often. He's not misreading stuff. It really is like, dude, you're under pressure. You don't have to heave the ball up. You don't have to. As you're going down, just chuck it up you know into nobody and it ends up you know to the other team so there is you know an element of daniel jones game where he tries to play hero ball that's where a lot of the fumbles come from late in the down or you know trying to make plays when you know you're gonna get hit that's where the Foles thing comes in for me right there's there's a willingness to make plays under pressure that leads to a wide range of outcomes and right now they're more bad than good uh, Washington's got Kyle Allen on the other side. I, I love it when the data backs up the point you want to make. So this is what you've been looking up here. Plays this season that have lasted 2.6 seconds or longer for the quarterback. Daniel Jones has a grade of 58, which is almost dead last in the NFL. Um, let me apply a more sensible filter and weed out the people. I think there's an argument to be made then if you get him better playmakers, guys that get open quickly, knowing that he he runs an NFL offense okay like he does NFL quarterback things all right and you make him rely less on hero ball plays there's a path to success 
for Daniel Jones. It's so the people around Daniel Jones in this particular statistic: Baker Mayfield, Gardner Minshew, Mitchell Trubisky, Nick Foles. It's there you just go. not a great group of people that thrive in the face of extending It's the guys plays. that I would expect, right. too. And then dead-ass last, Drew Locke, Joe Flacco, Dwayne Haskins, and by the way, Carson Wentz. So exactly the same thing, right? When, when the play lasts a long time, those guys are really bad at cutting bait and realizing that live another day, right? It's not going to happen today. Get rid of it. Don't make it worse. Those guys are desperately trying to make more happen than is available consistently and getting themselves into trouble. Matchup to watch here is going to be the Giants offensive line, who has the worst pass blocking grade in the NFL, against the Washington football team, number eight from a pass rushing standpoint. So keep an eye on that. But given the Daniel Jones stat, 3-0 and against Washington, the analytics say, got to go Daniel Jones. Yeah. I think so. Um, Carson Wentz, by the way, has 18 <laughs> turnover-worthy plays on those plays, which is double the, the next highest. It's really impressive. But the next highest is Mahomes, right? This is the thing, right? Mahomes plays like that, but most people are not Mahomes. You can't do that unless you're Mahomes. Um, Josh Speaking Allen, of, Daniel Jones both all have eight turnover-worthy plays. How many does Mahomes have, turnover-worthy? Uh, nine. He has one interception this season. Total, uh, yes. Which is incredible. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's go to that game. Carolina Panthers at the Kansas City Chiefs. Chiefs by 10.5 at home. We do have the Chiefs as one of the easier schedules in the NFL. I think this is going to start coming together where they're going to feel – they had some uneven games early in the year. They're going to start feeling more like the Super Bowl you know, leader that they are here, defending champs and favorite to win once again. The point about Mahomes, though, it's very easy to look at 21 touchdowns and one pick – Hmm. and say look at him taking care of the ball and dominating and all that stuff he 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 is playing well he's our number four graded quarterback but he's got six screen pass touchdowns this year the rest of the league has only 16 six already so two of them those little underhand things they shouldn't count i'm Just telling don't you don't count I, them it's teeing up the behind the bank pass i know that's all there and the interception luck for mahomes is incredible so he's getting some luck. He's getting help from his playmakers, and he's overall awesome. And, you know, Carolina, the team that's overachieved a little bit. But, you know, this is going to be another beat down for the Chiefs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the Chiefs offense will put up points. They put up 35 in the Jets, basically, like, not really caring about that game and treating it like a joke. Like, they were dancing around. They're like that. Why game. has it felt like that? that's how the Chiefs – is it because we're expecting the Chiefs to score 45 every week that it feels like they're just kind of – yeah. yeah. Going through the motions this year? I mean, they, they legitimately were going through the motions against the Jets and still put up 35. Um, the point is they will put up points against this Carolina defense, which isn't great. Uh, the question is, what can Teddy Bridgewater and the Carolina offense do against the Kansas City defense? Um, and it really, I think, comes down to can Teddy Bridgewater, like, change how he's been playing a little bit this year and just, like, he's supposed to be – this very careful conservative quarterback that doesn't put the ball in harm's way and is just efficient enough to get it done. And he's been efficient enough, but he's actually been putting the ball in harm's way a lot more than you expect from a guy of his style and has been getting away with it for most of the time. But when he doesn't, it looks bad, right? It's like, why did you just heave that ball into triple coverage late with the game on the line? That was stupid. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the, the Chiefs do a really good job of discouraging intermediate passes downfield passes so it, it does play into what the Panthers are going to do and Teddy's style of you know throwing the ball underneath and everything I think they'll have a little success against the Chiefs defense though they've done a nice job of using the playmakers Christian McCaffrey coming back here yeah maybe that will should be yeah maybe that will slow down the Carolina offense just a little bit having oh, a running back to rely on wow. is this one of those games where they play ball control and this is your best bet again against the Chiefs are they capable of running the strategy that you love keep the ball away from Mahomes, at least one or two extra possessions. I think McCaff the McCaffrey thing is interesting because they have been a little bit better without him on the field. And that's clearly not because of any failing of his. McCaffrey is arguably the best running back in the NFL, is a phenomenal player. So if you are better with him off the field, you're doing it wrong. You know what I mean? Like something about what you're doing on offense is not right when he's on the field. Now, have they spent the last while identifying what that is and figuring out how to change it because McCaffrey being on the field should make you better, right? Agreed? He's a, he's a really good player. Yes. Even if he's a running back, he should make you better 
by being on the field versus Mike Davis. The the uh, the nerds would tell you that when you have a good running back, I understand that it would it would encourage you to give the ball to the running back right. more. But but the point is, if you've sat there and seen the numbers and been able to have a bunch of weeks identifying the problem, you should be able to craft the solution to it. You should be able to work on a system that doesn't load him up so much that it actually has a detrimental effect on your overall efficiency. Yeah, I mean, I think the bottom line is when you're building a game plan, it starts and ends, or it starts with Robbie Anderson and DJ Moore. And then Curtis Samuel becomes a nice complement to that. And you move him around the formation a little bit and you scheme it up for Samuel. But is if this is where McCaffrey is really valuable. Like if he was with Drew Brees in the Saints or with Brady in, you know, in his career, and he was just the guy that happened to catch a few running back passes and just did more with them than the average running back, that's where McCaffrey's value is, much like Alvin Kamara with the Saints. But if the offense runs through Christian McCaffrey to the detriment of targets for Robbie Anderson and DJ Moore and Curtis Samuel, that's where you get into trouble. So if McCaffrey is viewed as option number four, which sometimes in a given game is like, man, we got Christian McCaffrey matched up with say, Kansas City's linebackers who can't cover. Mm. And you exploit that matchup over and over and over again, not for three yards a pop at it, but for eight to ten, that's where the value is. But it's at a game-by-game level, depending on matchups, and it's at a, you're still number four on our list after our top three receivers. If that's the case, then the Panthers can be better. And now you have Teddy distributing the ball to four legitimate playmakers and mismatch creators. It's just interesting because the Panthers have been given a lot of clues just dropped around the building that say that hey what you were doing with McCaffrey beforehand was bad it'll be interesting to see if they've pieced them all together and they've actually you know identified that that was a problem and we can change it and get better or if you just immediately go back to like hey Christian McCaffrey's back let's run the system through him again yeah and you go you actually get worse Uh, I think the Chiefs will have a lot of success on offense the Panthers best bet is to have you know, Brian Burns has been their best pass rusher after a, a slow start, you know, getting more strip sacks from him. and He's got you know, three sacks, I think, this year, and I think all of them all strip sacks. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm saying like, he needs like four and five, or five for them to have a chance against the Chiefs. They'd have to create some turnovers. Um, I like the Chiefs. I like the Chiefs to cover the 10 and a half as well in this one. At home, Miami Dolphins at the Arizona Cardinals. Tua, two? Yeah. Game number two at Arizona this is a nice matchup, Miami's defense against Arizona's offense here. It's fun. Um, I'm also going Chiefs, by the way. Oh, sorry, I didn't ask you. Yeah, yeah the, the Miami Dolphins' defense now has become a really interesting thing to watch week on week because they are showing signs that they have that Belichickian ability to match up with opposing offenses and to change week to week and to adjust and to do the things that make Belichick's dynasty in New England um, unique. And the reason that nobody's been able to like package it up in a book, take it with them and, you know, do the same thing elsewhere. Almost every single Belichick disciple seems to suck. Flores might be the guy that bucks the trend because what he did to the Rams looked a lot like what they did to the Rams in the Super Bowl. Yeah. Um, So I'm now fascinated to watch this defense on a weekly basis, particularly going up against a team like Arizona that is showing you something relatively unique, right? That isn't the same as every other offense. What did Miami look like this week going up against a completely different offense that is, again, unique and is going to require specific things to stop on defense? Arizona, I'm sorry, Miami runs the zero blitz. Again, when you blitz with no safety help, second most in the league, they crushed Jared Goff and the Rams with that. It's not a play. I mean, it's a play. It's a play call, a type of play call. It's not a system, so to speak. So you can't just run it. 30, 40, 50 times a game, you pick your spots. It could be five, could be 10, you know, in extreme cases. But what Flores was really good at, I think, with New England was when they ran it, picking the spots, which third down, which time, which time is this going to screw up the blocking scheme or screw up the, uh, the route concept? Those are the types of plays that determine this one, I think. Do you zero blitz a Kyler Murray? If you do it, he has incredible rushing ability. If he breaks the pocket, Dangerous. he's gone absolutely gone Jared Goff they're doing it against Jared Goff a lot because they're not afraid of that at all however the way Murray likes to navigate the pocket I remember when I wrote my scouting report on Murray a few years ago usually you dock a quarterback for dropping his eyes right you're like oh no he drops his eyes takes his eyes looks at the rush Murray kind of has to because he's agile he's like a little scat back back there so he does it and it works for him 
So I'm wondering if the Dolphins even try to do this. And if they do, if it's not to sack him, it's really just to not let him out of the pocket, trap him, and then he starts to navigate, and then you, you run into the sack. That little cat and mouse game, I think if the Dolphins really do try to come after Kyler Murray, is going to be an awesome one to, to watch here. Yeah, Murray leads all quarterbacks in rushing yardage, I think, and also yeah. scramble yardage. So I mean, He's on pace for like a 1,000-yard season and 16 touchdowns Yeah, on the ground. Yeah, yeah, he's got like seven rushing touchdowns. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. So the scramble yardage comes obviously on those passing plays where he does break contain and get out of there. But the rushing touchdowns have come deep in the red zone where he becomes this X factor that you can't deal with as an extra man down by the goal line, right? Suddenly... The classic example was what he did to Jeffrey Okuda when they played the Lions, right? He gets out. He's one-on-one with a defensive back. Against most quarterbacks, that's a win for the defense. Against Kyler Murray, it's a win for the offense in the same way it is when a running back gets one-on-one with a corner on the edge. Like, they're able to use him as a, you know, Pro Bowl caliber rushing threat that makes touchdowns happen when they wouldn't otherwise. The, The other thing that makes this work for Miami's defense is when they're healthy. When Byron Jones is on the field, when Xavier Howard's been on the field, uh, Mike Renner was putting the stats out. I don't know if they ended up on Twitter or not, but like they've given up almost nothing yeah. down the field with Byron Jones and Xavier Howard healthy. So we loved the Miami moves this offseason and how they revamped the secondary, added some pieces around Xavier, and there are some games where we're starting to see that. It's difficult to throw the ball on them because they've got the horses on the back end at cornerback. But again, anytime you play man coverage, there's a little risk against the scrambling quarterback so want to see how miami plays that shut down corner games he's got three of them three with zero yardage allowed at all in the last You're a bad name guy is that <laughs> shut down catch game. On? using rece- using yards yeah zero well yards? receptions will also get you there receptions the basis okay. shut down corner games when you don't give up a catch or a yard what about catches for negative two yards does that count I mean, depending on which one you use, they would, yes. Take screens out? But most of the time, if you give up a catch, you are going to give up yards. I would take screens out. And if you don't give up any yards, you haven't given up a catch. What do we get from Tua here? In uh, a dome, it'll be better. Yeah, and without, <laughs> without a huge amount of pass rush threat, like the Cardinals' defensive front is less scary than the Rams. Yeah. So in that, in that regard, I think it's a better matchup. But in the other way, it's not going to go the same way as last week, right? They're not going to have the fantastic game situation of your defense scoring, your, your punt return scoring. You're probably going to need Tua to do more than he did a week ago. But his life might be easier because you don't have to worry about Aaron Donald every snap. I'll be looking for a speed of the game. The Rams are a tough defense. Aaron Donald plus just a really good, um, just the way they play coverage on the back end. I, w- I just want to see how fast the game looks for Tua. I thought it looked a little fast for him in week one so if he can if it slows down for him a little bit and he can spread the ball around with the accuracy that he showed in college be keeping an eye out for that where you like what do you like who do you like in this game here uh it's a it's this is a sneaky good game i think the cardinals win yeah i like the cardinals too i think miami keeps it close it is tough to predict Tua had to do so little yeah last week like if fitzpatrick's the quarterback i might be picking miami to win based Mm -hmm. off how He'd been not so much how he'd been playing, but how the offense was producing with him at the helm. But I like Arizona in this one. I don't know what to make of Tua just yet. Four and a half. No Miles Gaskin as well, which won't help. Yeah, I like Arizona, and I, but I think it's closer. I think I like Miami getting the points at least. Denver Broncos at the Atlanta Falcons. Four points for the Falcons here. Denver coming off that incredible comeback against the Chargers. We gave the Broncos no credit on Monday. I think we just hate the entire AFC West. Well, we, when a team capitulates to the tune of 17 points for the third time in a season, it's them, not you. Them, not you, huh? What are you, what are you looking for in this one, Denver and Atlanta? So Atlanta's probably going to put up points. The Julio Jones, Matt Ryan, that connection is still alive and kicking, and it's still tough to stop. The question is, can Denver and Drew Locke keep pace against an Atlanta defense that still can't really cover anybody? Um, the Falcons giving up a pass rating of 117 this season, which is the third worst in the NFL. And when you consider one of the teams ahead of them is Dallas. Gross. And the other one, I think, is Houston. Like, it's bad. Uh, and Drew Locke, as we've said, has not been consistent. He had that one good game and even then didn't get the numbers credit for it. But overall, has been not good. So is this the game? Like, if you can't do it against this Atlanta secondary, when can you do it, is my point. Teams that have played cover two the most as a percentage 
This is how you use stats, Sam. Okay. Jets, Giants, yep, and Falcons. Oh. Don't don't run cover two. You just lose all your games. Nah, no. No. Right. What, so what it tells me, the Falcons have been under um, you know Dan Quinn. They've been that Seattle cover three team. They've they're trying to evolve. They're trying to figure something out schematically. <laughs> so they're going back. To is my point to right? They're trying to figure uh. something out schematically. So. Um, you know, the Falcons have been one of the biggest, I would say, PFF disappointments because our year over year, we go through, well, if you have a quarterback and you have guys to throw to and you have a creep back toward average offensive line, like you stumble into six, seven or eight wins, right? And the Falcons are finding ways to not do that because of their defense, because of their back seven outside Deion, uh, of Deion Jones over the last couple of years. So I'm always just keep an eye on what, what do they what do they have to build on here when i throw my name in the hat to run the falcons hmm. this offseason is it just grady jarrett is it just grady J is it just grady jarrett and Deion jones you know what it feels like is the bucks through the years where all they had was gerald mccoy and levante david right like those those are the two best guys on the box year after year and all you need to do is find some reasonable players around them nine of them <laughs> but you know you've got you know you have gerald i said gerald mccoy right mccoy yeah. and david Right, that's the Falcons right now. We got Grady Jarrett and we got Deion Jones, and that's it. AJ Terrell's looked okay. AJ Terrell's had some, you know, yeah. I mean, we, signs corner, of life. Corner's a tough spot to play year one as a rookie. He's been I, good. Yeah, he's been I think fine. I would be optimistic for him going forward, not necessarily you know this week. So that's just what I'm looking for every week with the Falcons. Is this like eye toward the future? Can anybody be a part of this rebuild? And if you're going to rebuild this thing, you do it the way the Bucks did which is high volume drafting of corners and safeties. And you stumble into a Carlton Davis and you stumble into a Jamel Dean at the right time. And, and boom, you've, you've got it. So um, I want to watch that. And it, you know, Drew Locke is, I think he's playing for his job every week. We're not, I, th I don't think we're overreacting to the fact that he hasn't shown enough that he's a, a franchise guy given what else is going to be available this off season. So Drew Locke in a dome against a poor pass coverage I mean, that's, Atlanta yeah. Falcons it should be a big game for Locke if he's going to be your guy going forward in Denver that's what I'm saying if you can't get it done this week when can you get it done I like Atlanta in this one yeah to win four points I'll, I'll, I'll take it yeah I think they'll cover I like Atlanta I just don't have any faith in Denver every week yeah. they're just week to week they'll have a nice game against New England a couple weeks ago they pull it off against the Chargers just not buying them Justin Simmons is awesome though great pick last week yeah. couple more to get through. Houston Texans at the Jacksonville Jaguars. You have Gardner Minshew out, Jake Luton in. He's a tall quarterback. I'm going to take him, Sam. Love, love tall quarterbacks. I mean, at least we're being saved from a, from a, a Mike Lennon game, right? Also a tall quarterback. Yes. Also Luton. A very thin head. Listed at 6'6". Six, six. I've seen him listed at 6'8 before, which is really... What? He was 6'. Yeah, I mean, look. Anybody who was... At least Ben listed it. Like Osweiler was listed at six eight. I think he's only six seven. Is that like we've all listed a little bit higher? I mean, I get an inch, but two. Is he listed at six six? If you're, now? If you're two inches shorter than your actual list height, it kind of feels like you're being an asshole. Maybe right? he just dropped it because of the um, Robert Mays research that tall quarterbacks can never be good. That would be smart. By the way, we did a bad job of um, selling what we have coming up on the show later on. Oh yeah, completely forgot to yeah, sell. We didn't sell it at all. Yeah, we'll go. We'll redo it. Okay, we'll Fine. redo the beginning. Sweet. A little inside baseball. We're going to do it. Um, Jake Luton's going to get the start for the Jags. He was just – he was one of those guys who definitely didn't jump off the screen and you weren't like, man, first-round pick. But he had a good, solid – last year, especially at Oregon State. Is this a secure the tank move? I mean, so Minshew's yeah. injured, right? This like They're not – benching Minshew like he turns out he had like a fracture in his thumb or something he, he is injured but look this but my point is is going with Luton as opposed to Mike Glennon is that a we're one and six we have six straight losses the Jets are in danger of securing this whole thing let's make sure we don't get too far away from that it's half secure the tank but pick. also your point overall right you've you always used Matt Castle as the example like why do why does Matt Castle right, what keep is the getting, point in right. Matt Castle why why is he we know what he is Backup quarterback, Matt Castle. Yeah. We know what Mike Glennon is at this point. You might as well find out what Jake Luton is and if he's going to be the backup to Justin Fields next year or whomever is over there, right, or whoever's there. So I think it's half. Yeah, you know, Luton's got to – he gives us the best shot to lose. 
Uh, imagine that at a press conference. <laughs> Why'd you go with Luton? I think he's good. he gives us the best opportunity to lose this week. Yeah, look, as, as goofy as Mike Glennon is, we put that guy out there. He could make a couple of throws and we'll right. win this game. We don't want that. We've seen Luton at practice. He's got the best opportunity to secure the bag at the end of the season. Bag being Trevor, mm. or Justin, Zach Wilson, whoever it might be. Yeah, I mean, the, the Jags are in this weird spot where look, everyone assumes the Jets are going probably winless and getting the number one overall pick. But after that, it's actually a really tight race, right? There's, it is. There's the Jags at one and six, the Texans in the same division at one and six, a whole bunch of teams with two wins. Like, you win one game by mistake. You can find yourself like eight <laughs> spots further down the draft. If you win one game by mistake. But that's what happened last year, right? Like the, the, the couple of teams ended up winning. Like Miami almost took themselves out of the quarterbacks to sweepstakes entirely by winning like a couple of late games. Almost completely screwed themselves. If you're the Jags and you, your entire season has almost been chasing this tank job and suddenly Mike Glennon balls out and you, win, you end up winning a game and pick eight overall – all three quarterbacks go before you have a shot. Now what do you do? Yeah. So Luton's the guy. I think he'll I think he'll do okay. The Texans are Do rough. you really? Yes. He's okay. He's not a bad player. The Texans defense is a train wreck and it's a very similar story to the Falcons, minus like the pillar players. You know, there's no <laughs> So they're just bad. They're just bad. I mean, they're kind of a knockoff for like the Falcon from the Falcons because you have an older J.J. Watt, you have Zach Cunningham who's underachieving and is not as good as Deion Jones, and you have maybe you know Justin Reed in the secondary is a guy. Yeah, and that's it. So the Texans, like I don't want either. I, I'll take either job, but they're they're two team. They're two teams that need to rebuild in a completely similar way, which is high volume back seven drafting, creep back toward average from a coverage standpoint. Uh, the Texans would have the number four overall pick if the season ended today, but they wouldn't because the Dolphins have it. Going back to, you know, Laramie mm. Tunsil's been really good and that offensive line has been shored up, but he's not worth the first round pick last year plus a potential top 10 pick this year. That is the risk of trading yeah. multiple draft picks for one player. Right. That is, <laughs> that is an ideal. So Texans by six and a half. I like them. Deshaun Watson. Can we hear that? What's? We got some uh, drilling going on. A lot of studio. drilling here at the office. It's a good thing we'll this play is a soundproof it, studio. We're very professional. We'll play through it. Don't even just ignore it. Don't oh, okay. acknowledge the All drilling right. that we can hear right in our ear. Um, Houston, I did lose my train of thought. Deshaun Watson is our number five graded quarterback. Yeah. And he's done it completely differently than he's done it in previous years where he, he usually has some super high-end games and some disasters. He's avoided the horrible game this year is my take actually being borne out so it took i think a while a, to go get going but now your it's, take was that he'd be a better quarterback with all the playmakers by the way the texans i don't want to say failed to trade will fuller they failed to come to terms with the packers in particular yeah for will fuller wouldn't move off their uh, asking price yes so will fuller not unreasonable is still there brandon cooks is still there uh kenny stills uh, randall cobb all these guys the playmakers and deshaun watson is actually really productive from a pass game standpoint. Right now, his PFF grade is 86.3, which would be the highest of his career. Yeah. Which therefore means I was right, and it just took a few weeks to happen, hopefully. Let's see if what uh, the question for Watson for me is, can he avoid some of those duds that he's had at various points? Yeah, because one, one of those puts him back, like, takes him back to lower but, than it was previously. But on one hand, it usually comes in games where he feels like he's got to do too much against the Ravens, whatever it might be. And they're like, you know, there's no pressure on Watson this year. Just go out and play, and you don't have to do too much. Uh, the, the rest of the offense is pretty good. The O-line's playing a lot better, and you've got a, you know, different style playmakers that they're, they're doing a decent job with. I like the Texans, and I like him to cover. Maybe Luton won't play that well. Six and a half on the road. Monday Night Football. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Patriots New at Jets. England at the Jets. The Jets are on prime time yeah. this late in the season. No ability to flex this thing. God. They should have COVID rules, just flex anything. They should just be flying. They move games to Tuesday nights, and they have 5 o'clock Monday night football games. You should be able to just be like, sorry, Jets. We'll see you Sunday at 1. It is kind of bizarre. Like ESPN pays like $2 billion a year to the NFL for their package. Yeah. How do they not have flexibility in that 
it built into that. I was reading about it a little bit the other day. It's because a big chunk of that money is the unlimited highlights that they get. Yes. No, this is true. They're but the still. only network that can go unlimited NFL right. highlights. And NBC can't. And CBS can't. But it feels like that's something you should definitely have built into your thing, right? The ability to flex a non-crappy game into a yeah. crappy game. ESPN's trying to steal Sunday Night Football from us. Yeah? From our boss. From NBC. Huh. In a couple of years. ESPN wants to get in on Sunday night. They want Super Bowls. They want... ABC, ESPN, Disney, you know. Disney. So yeah. there's uh, there's money to be thrown around soon as they as they look to renew contracts. Anyway, Monday Night Football is not looking great on paper. And then even more disappointing for the Jets, Clemson at Notre Dame this weekend. My, what a game this is. And it's uh, Trevor Lawrence is still out yeah. this week. Can I get a pronunciation on DJ? Well, it's not that. Uyalalege. <laughs> Something like that. Did you just insert a G in there from nowhere? No, there's a G in his name. I don't think it's at the end, is it? There's five syllables, I'm pretty sure. Five syllables? I mean, he's a future potential first rounder. He's got a cannon. Yeah. True freshman at Clemson. So, I mean, you can still watch that game, Jets fans. Right, but, but it's going to do you a lot of good for the Trevor Lawrence scouting. Well, you would be scouting what is Trevor Lawrence throwing to. Okay. Therefore, how inflated are his... Or how good numbers. is the system without him? How there? good is... It? Right. So if Uwe is terrible against the against Notre Dame, then you're like, okay, hmm. Trevor's the guy. What if he like destroys them? Now you Trevor like, Lawrence, system, system quarterback. System quarterback. System QB. Now what do we do? So that's your Clemson preview. Uh, Patriots are favored by seven and a half at the Jets. They're two and five Patriots. Is this the game their pass game gets back on track? Ugh. I mean, sure, because it's the Jets. Like what? So the Patriots got, came really close to knocking off the Bills with a game plan that worked. They should have a game plan that beats the Jets on the basis that, like, what wouldn't, right? So they should, I mean, they should win this game fairly comfortably, right? Because it's the Jets. Like, what, what more is there to say? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I like the Patriots in this game, obviously. We've, we've documented the Patriots' issues. Here's what's fascinating about this. Bill Belichick is admitting stuff. He's actually telling the truth. Stuff. He's telling the truth. Okay. Instead of just saying we got to coach better, and we gotta, he's actually getting out there and saying we went for it. The salary cap has been an issue. We're lacking depth because of decisions we've made in previous years mm. for a team that, we, that never went quote unquote went for it, and they never like really they, they didn't go for it in the way that other teams do, like completely mortgaging draft picks and left and right. Um, but yeah, like trading a second for a Muhammad Sanu is a level of going for it that the Patriots had not tried previously paying yeah. dead cap money to tom brady and others is just stuff that they don't do so we fully admitted they're essentially in transition mode um it also probably shouldn't absol absolve them of poor draft poor draft picks as well yeah it felt a little bit like excusey really you know? yeah like why would you? i mean okay it might be true right that yeah you did but he's the gm too they so did it's a, not an excuse that's what it's, i mean right but that's why that's why it's a little bit excusey it's like Yes, you did that. You went a little bit like the Saints have been doing with Drew Brees for the last few years, right? You understood that the time with Tom Brady was coming to an end. Let's try and get another one or two in before it, it all goes off the rails. They did that. On the other hand, like that's – you did that. You. You are the GM. You made this bed. Like, you can't be like, I don't know what to tell you. Like the, the, the higher-ups made some moves and I don't have anything to work with anymore. Like this is you. You took a shot at those Super Bowls. And now you're living with the consequences. Like, what well, you can't sort of bring it up as like, yeah, I mean, we're hamstrung. I don't know what to tell you. Like, yeah. But, but I think that's that's part of his point. That's just where we are right now. Um, I thought it was interesting. So the Patriots traded. I mean, it's a, it's a throwaway trade. They traded for wide receiver Isaiah Ford from the Miami Dolphins. They also tried to claim Dante Pettis. They but did. But the Giants got him on the waivers. The thing I just found awesome about Isaiah Ford coming in is he ran a 4 6 one at the combine he's got mm -hmm. good ball skills you know he's he has skills he's a nfl receiver but he's another kind of like on the slow end receiver so i'm looking up I mentioned how slow the patriots offense is they have demir bird who ran his 427 he's fast yeah he ruins the whole picture he does but everybody else Nikhil harry 453 gunner olszewski 456 isaiah fords 461 jacoby myers 463 and then tight end ryan Izzo 494 oh god the patriots feel slow and the numbers also say they're slow. I mean, we're here, and you know, even when Edelman's out there, he, you know, 10 years ago ran a 4.5 or whatever, but he's, you know, 35 right. years old. He hasn't old. got faster over that time. Right. So it's just a slow uh, – we're here because we have a slow 
offense where the rest of the NFL is creating passing offenses that are tough to defend. The Patriots have gone the complete opposite way. But I think they'll get back to the run game here um, against the Jets. And let's just continue to say Quinn and Williams is playing really good football. Yeah. For the Jets. How's that? It's good. Sam Darnold showcase game. This is the truth, right? Prime time. If Darnold has a good game, is he a future saint or somewhere similar? This whole remaining level of the season, he's banged up again, though, isn't he? Didn't they just scan his shoulder or something? Ah, geez, um, but the rest of the season is all about like Sam Darnold being. He's questionable. Yeah, he's. He, it's a showcase for him, right? Like his time with the Jets is clearly on its way out, no matter how much they. Yeah, they keep asking them about it, and they're like, oh, I got to do a better job of uh, surrounding him with talent, giving him something. Like, like, they're moving on, right? They can't go into next season having secured, presumably, the number one overall pick and not draft his replacement. So Sam Darnold is in the shop window for the rest of this season. Yeah. Playing, you're playing for all 32 teams, not just your own. So I like the Pats to win. Can they cover seven and a half? With Joe Flacco at quarterback? Yes. No, Darnold, Darnold's going to play. Really? With his questionable shoulder? It's questionable, but the uh, Monday's MRI turned out really good, <laughs> and he feels a lot better than I thought he would. Uh-huh. Per somebody. That's what yeah. Darnold said. Okay. Then I thought I would. I mean, they've, they've already hung him out to dry once. If it's Darnold, him. I think the Jets keep it close and cover. If it's Flacco, I got the Patriots by seven and a half. How's yeah. that? Uh, it's fair enough. Cool. That'll do it, man. That's week nine. All right, so coming up right now, the real... The real reason why you're turn, tuning in. Steve Smith, full interview, great discussion about wide receiver evaluation, business opportunities mm. for Steve. Mm -hmm. um, he kind of yells at Sam a little bit. It's great. It's a great interview. Love talking to Steve Smith. Self-proclaimed one of the most a, a unique individual. And I think, yes, he's great. You love him as an analyst as well, right? So And a player. Great. And as a player. So let's, let's talk to Steve Smith here. We recorded this yesterday. Great little discussion. All right, we are excited to be joined by Steve Smith. Steve, welcome to the show. Appreciate you taking the time. Uh, no problem. How are you guys doing? Doing, doing great. Doing great. Uh, I got to start out with this. Um, the elephant in the room, Steve. Uh, on national TV, you called me a nerd. I don't appreciate that. And uh, I need you to take that back. <laughs> well, uh, Steve, to be honest, uh, I, I'm I'm kind of a numbers nerd, right? I I geek out on numbers, so nice. you know, obviously, with you being part of uh, PFF, like it's really for me is is more of just I had expected <clears throat> not to see. And how tall are you? I mean, I'm I'm in the land of midgets, so everybody's taller than me. Come on, don't. So me. how tall are you? I, I listed six ten, about six. Okay, you're six. So you're six ten. Yeah. Wavy hair, long hair, right? Gorgeous, I just did not expect walk. that package. I, I just kind of assume mm, Sam maybe look. a co-host. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you. We're we're buddies now. I mean, look. The truth is, you know, after you yeah. insulted me in front of the national TV audience, you know, we hugged it out later, and you know, we we made amends, right? I mean, combine. I didn't know we. I, I didn't know there was something. No, I'm just. I'm just <laughs> a, I, I didn't know we had beef. <laughs> no, we had fun. We had fun on the show. Uh, that was on Good Morning Football a couple of years ago. So, well, I, yeah. I want to know about that. Are you really a numbers nerd now? How, as a former player, how do you mm. go about analyzing the game? Well, one of the reasons why I fell in love with uh, pro football focus and why I have I have my own account with you guys and 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 I really utilize it. Um, great example is I will look at a team and look at the box score and I'll allow the box score to create the narrative of my opinion of that team. Um, and, you know, just in business, I have some business businesses outside of football always have, and they're all based on numbers and numbers don't lie. Uh, numbers uh, don't sway you. Numbers uh, you can't manipulate them, right? You can hide and cheat with numbers, but you can't really manipulate them because in the end they will tell. And so um, <clears throat> I was I was somewhere and saw the wording. It was obviously I was passing through. It was a casino that had a hotel, a, a really nice hotel in it, but I was passing through it. And it said, 
you may win right now, but in the end, the house always wins. And so that's how I look at numbers is the, the house is the numbers and you'll always, <clears throat> the, the house will always win because we can say somebody's really good or really bad. But then when you bring up the numbers, then you go, ah, well, you know, I thought this. And so that's why I love the numbers. You're uh, a fun guy to watch as an analyst as well, not just a player, because I think part of this is you were such a good player in your own right that you have this unshakable confidence in where you're coming from, right? I did this for 16 years. I was at this level. I know what I'm looking at. And you are prepared to say when things aren't good or when, when things are when players are playing bad in a way that some players, some former players often aren't. How do you approach, you know, being an analyst and being prepared to sort of go to the negative place as well as the positive? Well, I mean, I, I, I try to really look at it, uh, you know, saying, first of all, thank you for that because being on TV and, and obviously you guys know having a podcast and doing as much hands-on number games as you guys do is you get people that either love you or hate you. Right. Right. And so there's people like, oh, he's dumb. He's uneducated. He doesn't do this. He doesn't do that. He doesn't watch film. I watch a ton of film. Right. Right now, my researcher, I shoot my researcher stuff like great example. Right now, I am trying to figure out the first five weeks, the San Francisco 49ers were at 49 percent run ratio. Right now, going into week eight, or coming out of week eight, going into week nine, they have dropped to seven. And my question is why? So first thing I said is, what is their first and second down average? One through five, and then now five through present. That tells me why the play action is not working. And it's not working because they're not ahead of the schedule on the sticks in first and second down. So I need to see what their second and third down to justify why? Because the numbers will tell, right? You you can't tell me that this player is in the top five because of how you feel about him personally. But then when I look at his his numbers and I go, well, he's in the top five in your mind, but he's not in the top five of all time. So he is not an all time great. He's a really good player for your reality, but not the holistic reality of the NFL and Jay Rice, Randy Moss, uh, Torrey Holt, all these fantastic players that, that are in the top 10, top 15, top 20. But if you're not there, then you're not, you're not in the top. That, that, that's just how it is. And that's not numbers that I've made up. That's just the facts. Right. Love it. I, I, I gotta, I gotta ask you about what, you know, scouting receivers in general, since you went there a yeah. little bit, it, it is, it's a difficult process, right? Scouting it's receivers. It's not though. Well, okay, then how do you how do you do it? What's the <laughs> so, secret? So here's why I say it's not a difficult task. Great example is let's just use a current event right now. I'm a former Baltimore Raven. People will say right now, they're like, Oh, I love Des Bryant. He's on the Ravens. Let's go. Well, you can have Des Bryant, but on the if Des Bryant was in the game last week against the Pittsburgh Steelers. When they ran all those plays to get in the game-winning position, how many passes did they throw? Hint, zero. Zero. They didn't throw it until they had to. So you can have Dez Bryant, Jerry Rice, Steve Smith, Senior, uh, Hollywood Brown. You, you can throw an echelon of players. But if your scheme is only built for X, Y, Z, and then all of a sudden you throw a Q in there or a R – then it does not work. And, and and so with the wide receivers, why I believe it's easy is when you scout guys, when I look at guys heading into the combine, I look at the year they're coming out. So right now I look at 2020. I look at all those guys when I need to because I'm still in the season. But then I'll go back to the year before to see what did they do the year before they became the guy that's about to get drafted. Because that's going to tell me something. Great example, Juju Smith-Schuster. Juju Smith-Schuster, his first year when he trans when he switched over to wide receiver, was his best year. His his senior year, his year before he came out and the Pittsburgh Steelers drafted him, 
he kind of has played in his year at USC kind of like he's playing with the Pittsburgh Steelers right now. He comes and goes. But when he was playing with AB, that was how he played his rook, his his freshman and sophomore year, which is he was really good, he was really effective, and he snuck up on people. That's what I like to see. That's what tells me the history of a wide receiver. And then also, too, what system is he going to? Is he going to a number system? Is he going to a West Coast system? Is he coming from Baylor, where Baylor teaches their wide receivers on the, on the backside of routes and then run game, you don't have to run a route. They don't really run route trees. They don't look and get in a huddle and look at plays. How big is their uh, route tree? Their, I use the word PhD. How, you know, there's, there's roughly about 10, 11 routes on a route tree. If you only run in five, well, when you get to the league, you're going to have to learn that. And, and, and so all of that, then I got to go with their receivers coach. Who is their receivers coach? What is he known for? What offense did they run? All of that stuff tells me what kind of player he will be. And then also I watch the quarterback. You know, what kind of what kind of quarterback is he? Is he a quarterback that panics and, you know, throws a ball uh, erratic? Uh, you know, James Washington was a guy that I really loved coming out. He was kind of like a China, a, a bull in a China closet, very stiff, but he's a, you know, he, he was real burly. But yet, Mason Rudolph, their quarterback, he was erratic. He didn't play well. I got a flack for it. Then all of a sudden, Mason Rudolph is a guy last year, and it comes out. He wasn't very good. Ding, ding, ding. Some former <laughs> wide receiver said that, but I don't get credit for that. Or a Josh Rosen. Watched him in college. Talked to some people at U UCLA and said he, he, he kind of, he likes to, he likes to get pampered. He he pouts. He this. Then all of a sudden things get a little edgy in Arizona. I get flat because the way I came at him about it. And then where is he now? They went to the Dolphins. He was so good as the Dolphins as a backup. They decided to send him somewhere else. So you know, I, I just watch a lot of film and, and watch the history um, historically of those players. And then I, I I start poking around the facility and asking coaches that I know. What is this kid like? Who is he? What's his DNA? What's his Y factor? And you'll be you'll be amazed when I talk to some of these guys or talk to some of these coaches and I ask them, what's their why? Their why sometimes shows you why they're out the league very quickly. I've heard you say in the past that, you know, as a receiver, you can just see another great receiver, right? You know if that guy has it or not. What, what's... I mean, you can see, like, he has good habits, right? right. You know, like... You're not going to, and what I mean by that is, I like to cook, so I'm gonna use a cooking analogy. If you cannot cook a grilled cheese, it is no way in hell you can cook Thanksgiving, right? That's, that's just, <laughs> <laughs> if you can't make a grilled cheese, you can't make macaroni and cheese, you cannot make mashed potatoes, and you gonna screw up the turkey. <laughs> right. Uh, what what's like the first trait that you're looking for when you look at these receivers? Because I've been working hands. on this theory. Hands. I want to see, do they catch the ball with their hands? So okay. hands are the grill cheese. Do they make the diamond or do they breastplate? Right. Do Are they, you know, some of these guys where they're catching it like this. I've seen some wide receivers catch the ball like this. Yeah. That's... That tells me, that tells me they don't have confidence. I can tell you this, this will change the, this will change the way you look at wide receivers. Look at a number one or number two wide receiver who hasn't caught a lot of passes in a game. The first pass that's intended to them, they catch with their chest. Why? Because they, they're they so psychologically out of it. They're like, I can't screw this up. So I got to go to what's something easy. And how do I know that? You I've did. done that. <laughs> I, I've, I've gone two or three quarters, haven't catched the pass. Now I'm pissed off. Now I know if I don't stay focused and I drop this ball, I may not catch another one. And that's happened. So I'm like, all right, let me body catch a little bit. Let me get myself going. So let me body catch it. All those things, man, come in factor. That's why I, that's why I love watching film about people. Um, I'll watch a game winning catch and I'll pause it to see how the receiver's hands were because that tells me what kind of catch, what, how do they catch the ball? Are they confident in themselves? Why are they not confident in themselves? Then I'll go back and rewatch the whole game and see were they getting jammed on the line? How was this going? So it, for me, Watching a football game for me, I can watch a game, watch 15 plays, and I'm done. 
details. You need to get yourself on that that Peyton Manning detail show. You need to do a, a wide receiver detail episode with Steve Smith. I love it. Yeah. That would be good. Mm, I'm creating my own content, so I appreciate that. Let me write that down, too. (laughs) All right, I got to ask you about speed receivers because every year, Combine, you get these guys running Mm -hmm. Mm 4-3 or in Henry, you know, or sub 4-3. And, like, that's the easiest thing to do in scouting. Like, I see 4-3, this guy, therefore, he's fast. But obviously, at the NFL level, there's a difference between when it works, when Tyreek Hill is out there and an absolute game changer. And Deshaun Jackson, 10 years of being a legitimate Mm -hmm. deep threat. I'm always Absolutely. fascinated with what separates the really good, fast, playmaking, deep receivers with other guys who are technically just as fast, run four two eight and four three, and they just can't be as productive at the NFL level. Like what separates those players? The teams that they go on, right? You put Deshaun Jackson with Cincinnati Bengals, a la John Ross, and what happens? Ouch. So, so do you think John? So, do you think John Ross, as an example, could go and and rejuvenate his career somewhere else? It depends. I think depends on his psychologicals. You know, his his psychological mindset, his why, why is you know where is he at mentally? Um, I don't know. You know how mentally strong he is. Obviously, with things going on, um, but he's also a guy who has been hurt. He's also a guy, in my opinion, when I watched him in college, he struggled catching the ball. Um, when a receiver got very, when a corner got very physical with him, there were times in Washington um, he he showed out early, but then he um, you couldn't find him um, in the big games. Uh, they utilized him in a lot of underneath passes in the league with that much speed. They want to push him across the field. He, he doesn't for whatever reason. It's not going well. However, the other part is, um, you know, I was lucky enough. It does. You it does go with you can get screwed over and get done in your career if you are not with a good team. If your co- if the coaching staff is a good, if they don't put you in the right position, right? Juju Smith Schuster goes to Kansas City. Who knows how he's playing, right? He'd be looking pretty Juju Smith. Yeah. You know, Juju Smith Schuster goes to Jacksonville. He's screwed, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, it does. What, what about just the adjustment to the NFL? You talk about we got to run 10 or 12 routes and maybe only ran five in college. What about everything you need to know as a receiver? How complicated is an NFL offense with sight adjustments, reading coverage on mm. the fly? How difficult is that? Because we hear about it a lot, but the fans don't always truly know what you're dealing with as a receiver. It sounds so silly, but, bro, it, ha- it really has to do with the, the, the system. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. The system you in can help you or hurt you. Yeah. Bottom line. Great. Here's another example. Kevin Walters, who was the number two to Andre Johnson for years in Houston. Right. Love Kevin. Kevin had three, two, three years with Tennessee after he left Houston. Did you know that? No. Because <laughs> it's the system. Yeah. Right. And and it's nothing wrong. And I'm not saying Kevin Walters is is a system guy. He knew that system to a T. That was his role. But when he went to Tennessee before Tannehill, before Vrabel, that system was not built around and built for wide receivers. Randy Moss was there for a little bit, and what happened? Same thing. Every, you know, you have to go to a system that you understand that is familiar and that can utilize you in the right way. Coaches are human. They make great people but sometimes they're not they don't do a good job with it and vice versa you go with andy reed look at look at all the people that's under andy reed they all have jobs right doug peterson he's probably gonna get fired matt Nagy, he's probably gonna get fired all the guys who are with andy reed who are trying to outdo or show you what andy reed has taught them they miss the one thing they aren't andy reed right they all struggle to run the ball they don't establish the run. All of that stuff plays in. I mean, I'm looking at what? Uh, um, what's his name? What's my boy? Ted Ginn. Ted Ginn gets released right. because he's not being used. But is the running game being used? No. Right? Their offensive line is beat up, but yet they keep still trying to throw the ball. Like, it's just too much going on. There's too many things going on. So it's just, I think your system can help you or hurt you. 
Yeah, and that's, I mean, it's why free agency is still, it's not as much of a crapshoot as the draft, but it's not like every single free agent is a success because scheme is a huge part. So just because a guy was really good someplace doesn't yep. mean he's going to be really good in the next place, even if you gave him a, a big money contract. Um, yep. Let me take you back to your playing career for a second. I know everyone's going to remember you as this great wide receiver, but you were also one of the best punt returners that I have ever seen. But when you become this great receiver, you, you get your, your valuable asset, right? Now you don't get to mm -hmm. return punts. Do you sometimes think, you know, man, I could have been like Devin Hester as a punt returner on top no, of this wide receiver career? Mm -hmm. De Hester's my boy, and I could never be Devin Hester. I'm gonna just tell you that right now, man. I, I, Devin Hester. When I, when you think about Miami and and Devin Hester and punt returners, I remember when I was in college the same time uh, Santana Moss, man. I remember Santana Moss, and and you go with, uh, um, you know, Dwight How, uh, um, Desmond Howard, uh, Brian Mitchell, all these guys. I love punt return, but here's a cool story nobody knows. You, do you know why I'm a, I, I was a punt returner? No. Nope. My dad used to punt for semi-pro. And when I was a little kid, like every other little kid, you just follow your pop, right? And so he used to go to the park uh, on 126th Avalon. It used to be called Willowbrook. Now it was Magic Johnson Park uh, in Los Angeles. And he used to punt. And so I started six, seven, eight, nine years old going with my pop. And then I started just trying to catch him because I thought my dad was the best punter in the world. He's playing semi-pro and I was like, wow, my dad can punt. Oh my gosh, right? Like every other little kid, they think their dad is, is, is invincible. And he used to punt, man, and I used to try to catch him. So at six or seven years old, I was just trying to catch punts because my dad was punting and I just wanted to catch one of my dad. Let's be honest, I wanted to catch one of my daddy's balls. And so I'm out there, right? And that's how I did it. And that's how I learned. And then I ended up being a punt returner in Pop Warner and middle school and high school because I was the only kid that can catch it fluently <laughs> because I had been catching them for like 10 plus years. That's and that's cool. not easy. So, that is right, not but easy I was just punts. doing it. I, I literally learned how to do it because I just wanted to be around my dad. Do you, do you think it's right though that the NFL tends to try and protect their their best players from those as soon as a guy gets good at receiver or running back immediately he's no longer the punt return anymore because he could get hurt well no it's not that you can get hurt it's sometimes like when i was doing both when i at one point i was the kickoff returner with ross smart and the punt returner and the starting wide receiver i was running 85 plays a game yeah, that's a lot right now 85 plays a game today is like that's easy but 85 plays now, plus 10 or 15, that's 100 plays. There were times I used to have to get an IV at halftime because my, my workload was just too much. And so they had to decide we have to do both because if he does, he has to do one or the other because if he does right. both, he's running out of energy, right? So if I go in that third quarter to get an IV, uh, they don't stop the game for me. Right, so now I'm not able to, to play at all. So that, that, that was the reason why. That makes sense. Love it. So uh, real quick, you, you talked about systems and how that makes, makes or breaks the receiver. So throughout your career, was there a system, a play caller? Wh where did you feel most comfortable? Was, is there a favorite year or system or period of your career that you just liked the best? I mean, I can, I can take in a year, it, I can take from a lot of different years because I learned so much in the good years and bad years. Playing with Vinny Testaverde when Jake DeLone gets hurt, I learned a lot from Vinny because he had been around so many great wide receivers, Lavernius Cole, some of those guys. So he gave me some information, right? Obviously, Rodney Pete, he gave me some information. Uh, he, you know, played with Herman Moore. So all these guys when he was with the Lions. And also, I grew up in L.A., so I was a huge USC fan. Um so I just learned a lot of different things. I really, playing at Utah really helped me as saying, playing the, the, the caliber of guys, playing Wyoming, Air Force, where they weren't man-to-man -man coverage, they were zone. So understanding how football really works, how coverages work. For me, when I got to the league, I just needed to know how the lingo was, but I already knew how to read a coverage. I understood it. The league just helped me in, it enhance what I already knew. So for me, knowing football from the shoulders up 
really made it easier at times from the shoulders down for me to go play ball. So we asked on Twitter what questions anyone would want us to ask Steve Smith if we were going to have him on the podcast. And yeah, that, that's a lot of dumb questions then on Twitter. <laughs> well, a Sorry, lot of we people. We filtered them. We filtered them. Yeah, yeah. We, we've, we've stripped out the terrible In other words, ones. you're correct. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of people wanted to know something about trash talk or, or all that kind of stuff. Oh, no. And our friend Chris Law came up with what is my favorite question, which is, did you ever trademark Ice Up Sun? and think about selling I, merch because we've got yeah. suggestions on ways you could you could turn a profit on that. Well, I did not trademark it. Someone else trademarked it no. as soon as I said it. And really? they've been holding it. And they, because oh, I'm no. such a, because I'm such a, um, what word do I want to use? <laughs> Unique person. Um, Good one. I'm not going to buy it. I'm no. not going to buy the trademark. Screw those guys. That trademark. That trademark is gonna sit there for whatever they think. I can care less about it because to be honest, the whole ice up merchandise thing, man, you know, it's up and down. I mean, unless your name is Jordan and Nike, Reebok, Puma, Adidas, you know, Yeezys, whatever, all those different ones, bro, you're not you're not gonna really make any money, <laughs> right? You're not gonna make good, good money. And, I'm, and when I say good, good money is a lot of my investments, a lot of my business stuff, I call it mailbox money. So meaning, um, Right, I'm doing this podcast and tomorrow um, there will be a check in the mail and I can go to my mailbox in some shorts with no underwear, uh, a wife beater and some flip flops and I'm getting paid player. And that's, that's, that's what I love. Like I don't want, I want that mailbox money. From our podcast? No, Are no, you no, expected no, a check from us? You know, yeah, for, Steve, from you're paying us. You, you got that, <laughs> right, Steve? You're, you're covering Steve's appearance fee. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know that we were sending you that check. <laughs> hey, that you here's the go. thing. I, I take a lot of different things. I, I'll, take, I'll take 25 bucks. My, my kids get on me. They say, Dad, you act like you broke. I am. <laughs> I got four kids. I am broke. Oh, that's good. I mean, look. I've only got one, and I know the feeling. Don't worry. It's good. Be, <laughs> being smart with your money and... I mean, did you did you want to throw out some of your ideas, Sam? That he well, can't not, make money on? Not now no. that somebody else is sitting on the the Peyton. We can't yeah, we yeah, can't we make that guy. We money. don't want to. Sam was excited to show you all of his. Oh man, yeah, we could have ideas. We could have had a business conglomerate based off that, but some guy's squatting on it. I like. Oh, it. Okay, so let's let's go through it. What's the ROI then? Well, we look, want a full business startup, plan. What's the startup there? cost? I mean, that's debatable. We'd have to we'd have to cost this out first, Steve. First, we're going to see get if Neil like Hornsby. Well, let me get our founder, Neil Hornsby, in here. He's the best yeah. business process guy we know. We'll get his. We're more his ideas process. guys than the actual, you know, business process. We leave that to somebody else. Actually, that is my new role. Oh, business well, okay. process now. I'm, I should I've be become the ideas guy. Somebody else deals with the business side of things. So, okay. Yeah. I just said you could instead of uh, like, like smearing off ice would be all over this thing. Yeah. Right. Mm. Smearing yeah. off. But but yeah. He, don't drink and drive and don't drink and vote. No. Hmm. no they were, saw that yesterday with, with, with Shamir Malfi. That. <laughs> Is that what they said? <laughs> yeah. And then, don't, and then don't, don't vote. And, don't, uh, don't drink and vote. <laughs> it was really, it was and then after tough. voting season, they need a new campaign and now it's ice up, son. Yeah. It's Mirna Ice. Oh, look at that. Right? I we still, don't have it. So oh, we I don't. still we like don't. The, the jewelry idea. We could have got Steve Smith, 89 branded chains. We could have been all over this thing. Yeah. You see, I'm now, Sam. That's, um, I think that's kind of a little bit of bias. Why is chains? Why is it jewelry? Huh? It could be anything. Just chains is the first jewelry item I thought of. Could be rings. Could mm. be whatever. Whatever you want. Mm. Any form of jewelry. You start okay. somewhere and then expand the brand. Right. I think is what. You got to yeah, okay. start if you're your first. Your I, th first I, th item. I thought you were kind of hitting on because I'm black, so after former athlete, we like jewelry. No, you know, no, I'm just saying that's one of the things. We do. I've I'm also joking. got. <laughs> I've also got whiskey. <laughs> Steve, Steve, like, Steve oh. sensitive times. <laughs> sensitive times right now. We can't have jokes. We have a whole new HR department here. We can't have jokes. <laughs> Because he put beer coolers in there too. Yeah, I got right? a whole list of stuff. See if you can beer see my coolers, bullet points. ice packs. <laughs> Quick, backtrack. Just backtrack. <laughs> Any, do you got anything else for him, Sam? This is awesome. No, I'm out now. I get somebody's somebody's ruined my business idea by squatting on his patent. We're do done. you want to come back during draft season? Because I think your scouting evaluation stuff. I think it's fascinating. Like I would love to hear your take on draftable receivers once, uh, you know, the off season hits and you have a chance to watch those guys. Put you on the spot. Yeah. Yeah. I if mean, we send I, you a I, check, I, I, will depends, you come yeah, back? It depends how much money is going to arrive in his mailbox after this one. Yeah. No, see, that's, see, see, Sam, you missed it. In my philosophy, 
Pennies equal up to nickels. Nickels equal up to dimes. Okay. Dimes and quarters. And enough quarters equal up to dollars. I like it. I pick up change when I'm walking around town. Don't 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 get it twisted. <laughs> well, we're I'm definitely like anything. the change podcast. We're not the dollars. We're, <laughs> the, we're the pennies. And look, I I have a change bot, a change container that I use, um, and I do it every six months. Like uh, six months ago, six hundred uh, six hundred and four dollars. Nice. I love it. Yeah. You said you're a unique individual. I love it. It's great. This is fun. We learned about a lot about you and a, a lot about player evaluation, saving money, and your uh, business acumen. So much appreciated, Steve. Let's do it again. Appreciate it. Thanks so All much right. for doing this, Steve. Thank you. Hey, keep keep pumping out those numbers, man. PFF is doing it. I, I love it. I really do. I sometimes just geek out. I got the premiere, so I sit there and look at it. I love looking at a corner's target ratio. Right. Yeah. Man, when I can see that corner's giving up 73% of the time when he's targeted, ooh, throw it his way. <laughs> <laughs> what can we, and you uh, can sell for us. That's what great. can we plug for you, Steve? You're on NFL Network for those I'm Thursday on night NFL games. Network, um, on Thursday night, but also, too, I have my own podcast. It's called Cut To It. There we go. Um, and so we, we interview uh, sports men and women and we give them an opportunity. We dive deep. Uh, we don't talk about their... We talk about a little bit about uh, of who they are as a as an athlete, um, but then we really want to know, you know, where are you from, uh, you know, what makes you tick, uh, why are you here, what's what's your why, and um, I really want to know because I know for sure for a fact. Sometimes when you see these guys playing really really well, or or girls or women playing really really well, sometimes their life outside of football is not as rosy as we think. Yeah. And um, and I love hearing those stories because sometimes you'll find out some things like I just did the Darren Waller um, uh, 360 and, you know, talking about him, how he was, you know, addicted to uh, drugs and what he went through since he was 15 years old uh, to pretty much a couple of years ago. But no one would have knew it. And how he got there and why he got there was pretty remarkable. So I, I love sitting down with with former athletes and current athletes and knowing their why and who they are um, outside of football and asking the questions that people don't want to ask. Like people always want to ask, oh, what is it like catching that pass? I want to know, what did you go through prior to you catching that pass? Right. That's awesome. And the Darren Waller story, great, great story. So yeah. everybody go check that out. I love it. Thanks, Steve. This was great. Thank you. Appreciate it, man. Are you afraid of Steve Smith? I mean, not remotely, as in through remote. If he was here, though, you were, means you were. I mean, look, he is significantly more intimidating than you, despite being significantly smaller than you. That's because you've seen him fight. You have never seen me fight. I haven't, but I don't imagine that would change my perception. Yeah, he's got a little edge to him, which is good. That's yeah. why he was such a good player. Played with edge. No, that was awesome. I really want to have him back around draft time, talking receivers his evaluation methods and what he sees and everything. So that was great. We'll do it again. Appreciate having Steve on the show. Appreciate you guys listening. So week nine, everybody enjoy all the football. We'll be back here Monday morning reviewing all of the action. Everybody have a good one. Thanks for watching the PFF YouTube channel. And if you want to subscribe, all you have to do is push the button. Don't forget everything you get. A little fantasy, push the button. A little green line for the gambling aspects of the game? Push the button. College football? Push the button. The YouTube channel from PFF.